We can throw up those slides. I'll run through them very quickly. First of all, uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. For more information on getting your vaccine and for signing up for notifications, go to uh, the website indicated there. Second, um, we're uh, in kind of the mid-year of our board and commission appointments. We make our board and commission appointments in March, and then right around this time of year, we, we take a step back and look at uh, vacancies. We have some vacancies um, in the Beverage Licensing Authority on two Boulder Junction Access District Boards, one for Parking Commission, one for the uh, Travel uh, Demand Management Commission, uh, one for the Downtown Management Commission, and one for the Boulder, uh, excuse me, the Housing Advisory Board. So if you'd like to apply to any of those boards and you're over 18 and resident of Boulder, please go to uh, the city's website at Boards and Commissions. And then finally, tonight we're going to be reviewing uh, draft uh, versions of uh, two master plans, but there's a, another, yet another master plan that's actually in the works, and that's the police master plan. Uh, Judy and I are serving on the process committee on, on that, and, and that is referred to as reimagining policing. And uh, we're going through the first window of our community engagement for that, and that runs until July 31. So if you would like to be heard uh, on the first, um, the first go around on the police master hand plan, go to Be Heard Boulder and uh, sign up either for a survey or to be, uh, to be interviewed by a staff member. And with that, I think we're beyond the announcements and we will go on to the study session itself. We have uh, three items for tonight's study session. We'll spend about 90 minutes uh, checking in with the Parks and Rec uh, Department on their master plan, which is nearing completion. Um, we'll then check in with the planning and transportation uh, groups uh, on their East Boulder sub-community plan, which is about 60% of the way done, and they will have a few questions for us. And then uh, that'll take about 90 minutes as well. And then uh, at about 9 o'clock, we'll spend a few minutes at the end of our meeting uh, with a report from uh, Rachel and Jen Sprinkle on our city uh, attorney recruitment process. So with that, we'll, we'll start with the Parks and Rec Master Plan check-in. I just want to give a quick preview before turning it over to Nuria to introduce her team. Um, the presentations are relatively short for parks. Uh, they will have sprinkled throughout their presentation about six questions. Um, so please give them a few minutes for intro. And then uh, the first two questions will be at slides seven and eight. Uh, another question will come in around slide 11. And then their final three questions will come in around slides 13 through 16, and then they'll, they'll bring us home. So with that, Nuri, I'll turn it over to you to introduce uh, the Parks and Rec staff. Sure, I'm excited to, um... Uh, for everybody to see this presentation and to um, hear your comments as we move forward. I will ask Allie Rhodes, our Director of Parks and Rec, um, to get us started and to introduce everyone that she's got with her. Thank you, Nuria. It's going to be a waterfall of, of introduction here. So I'm Allie Rhodes. Mm -hmm. I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, the 2014 master plan has led us to great success and city council accepted it. And in the past year and a half, it's provided critical guidance as we've made very hard choices amidst the pandemic. We're really looking forward to hear from you tonight and from the community what is most important next for Boulder Parks and Recreation. I'm honored to lead a team of incredibly talented professionals. And so from here, we'll hand it off to my colleague, our planning and ecological services manager, Jeff Haley. All right, thanks, Allie. And yes, let me just echo uh, Council, it's great to be back with you as we talk about our needs assessment specifically this evening. Um, as Ali mentioned, our master plan is critical. Um, it, it guides our day-to-day -day operations as well as our long-term policies and, and investments. Um, you know, it's very actionable. We use it all the time, our existing plan. In fact, there's many current initiatives happening now that City Council is engaged in where it's a direct representation of the, the outcomes and success of our plan, such as the capital infrastructure tax, some of those investments we're considering, um, our ongoing budget discussions, um, and how we do our day-to-day -day operations and, and the various work you see across the community. So again, uh, we're excited to be here this evening. You'll hear in just a moment um, where we are exactly in the process and then where we're headed next. Um, but again, this evening is really focused on that needs assessment phase. Um, during this phase, we, we've spent a lot of time as a staff team and our consultant team diving into a, a wealth of data and research about what our community um, has in terms of our parks and recreation services programs and facilities. And we've been looking at also how we compare to other uh, peer communities, both within the state as well as nationally. 
um, and certainly taking, taking somewhat of a deep dive into our finances, uh, into our budget, because those resources are really what drive most of all the, the programs and, and services we deliver. And so tonight we'll be sharing a pretty high level overview of some of those topic areas, just as um, Bob mentioned. Um, and we will be pausing um, as we go for questions. Um, but tonight uh, is certainly your chance to, to give us your thoughts. We're anxious to hear from you um, and to have you weigh in on some of these areas that we've, we've brought forward. Um, but this isn't the last touch uh, by any means and council will certainly be engaged as we move forward later this year and into next year. So there's plenty more uh, opportunities for your involvement um, on the horizon. Um, let me just give a special thanks right off to uh, our Parks and Rec Advisory Board as well. They've worked very um, hard with, with us and our team over the past several months to help support and inform this plan. And we wanna just uh, mention them. And I'd like to just uh, highlight our, our project team that's with us this evening. Um, so Regina Elsner is our project manager, one of our planners uh, in BPR, and Morgan Gardner is also one of our planners that's supporting this process. And then we also have our design, uh, design workshop consultant team here with us, and that includes Sarah Horn and Eric Krongold, who will be um, supporting the presentation this evening. So um, I did want to mention also, um, we have a variety of information you'll see at any time though, as we're in the dialogue and, and discussion uh, portions, feel free to ask us uh, questions. If some of the information, if you'd like more um, in-depth information or clarity, um, this is about sharing information and hearing from you. So please let us know how we can best support that. And so at this point, I'll turn it over to Regina um, to share where we're at in the process. Thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. So we were last with council in December. Um, and since our last discussion with you, uh, the project team has completed our research and trends phase of the project which culminated in a system overview snapshot. Um, you were, a link to that document was included in your packet. That document is really a high level uh, capture of the current status of Boulder Parks and Recreation using national and state level trends to identify the path forward for this master plan update. The research and trends phase also included our first window of community engagement, where we were able to confirm the key themes that were identified within our 2014 master plan are still relevant and important for this master plan update. This engagement window also confirmed for us that both equity and resilience are important issues that our master plan update should include, but it clarified also that those should both be issues that are woven throughout all of the work of the department and not, are not standalone issues. As Jeff mentioned, we are currently wrapping up our needs assessment phase. Uh, that included a significant amount of data gathering and analysis, um, which we'll be diving into a little bit more tonight. Following the needs assessment phase, we'll be moving into our implementation plan in the coming weeks and months. During that phase, we will be identifying and prioritizing the strategies and initiatives for the department to focus on for the next five to seven years. There will be, as Jeff mentioned, at least two more touch points with council after tonight, one later this year during implementation plan, and then again sometime in the first half of 22 for our final plan uh, acceptance. This master plan update process relies on the same three-pronged approach to planning that the department's previous master plan relied upon. This approach includes input from research, policy, and the community to form the basis of the recommendations contained within the master plan. This input does include coordination with other city departments to ensure that our work supports those other cities' initiatives as well as larger citywide initiatives. The master plan recommendations are considered through both the lenses of equity and resilience to ensure that they are meeting the city's goals related to both of those issues. During this needs assessment phase, we had a significant window of community engagement. This included a statistically valid community survey, some quick polls on Be Heard Boulder to complement that larger survey, um, as well as a public open house, the first hosted by the city since the start of the pandemic. 
The project team has also been doing some targeted outreach with youth through both Growing Up Boulder and the Youth Opportunities Advisory Board with our Latino communities, as well as with people experiencing homelessness. All of this input has influenced the findings and discussions that we'll be talking about this evening. At this point in time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the presentation over to Sarah Horn with Design Workshop. She's going to start our conversation with one of our key themes, community health and wellness. Thanks, Regina. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. It's very nice to meet all of you, even though it's virtually. Um, and I wanna thank you for taking the time um, to discuss this update with us. I'm gonna briefly highlight, as Regina mentioned, um, a few of the key community health and wellness findings, um, specifically related to parkland and park amenities. Then I'll ask you a couple of questions to help us move forward. And after that, Eric um, will discuss the next key theme findings. And so this um, slide, as you know, BPR manages a lot of parkland and other recreation facilities. All in, it includes more than 1,800 acres of urban parkland and 138,000 square feet of facility space. And we've been finding these spaces are very well used. In fact, talking to BPR staff, we um, found that they've seen high levels of increased use of outdoor facilities um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, along with an increased use of these spaces um, by members of surrounding communities um, who don't have as many resources available. Um, and this trend is being seen throughout the country. So this increase in use, along with Boulder's popularity as an outdoor mecca, um, for tourists from around the world adds an additional layer of complexity to how BPR operates and manages its facilities. And while high, high use in many ways is a good problem to have, um, it does strain O&M resources and capacity. And this in turn impacts staff's ability to continue to provide high quality core facilities and services. At the same time, we're hearing from community feedback that more facilities and facility types are desired. If this holds true, the need for access to a wide variety of facilities and programs will likely increase. And with Boulder, again, being one of the premier places in the country to play outside, this trend will only be amplified. With limited ability to add parkland, the city has to decide how to continue to best serve current and future community members, as well as visitors. So to do this, we think reassessing how level of service is measured and looking at alternative ways to better serve the community with available parkland are worth exploring. Um, so Regina, if you could go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, hold on. Okay, yeah. So this chart um, illustrates the relationship between population and parkland acres over the next 20 years. And the red line is population and that's steadily increasing. The blue line represents total parkland acres, which remains flat, and the green line represents developed parkland acres, which are expected to be fully built out by 2040. So it's basically showing that acreage isn't keeping up with growth. So if that does prove to be the case, it will result in a continuing, continually dropping level uh, of service for parkland as currently measured based strictly on acres per capita. And even with full build out, an additional 226 acres would be required to maintain today's level of service. The good news is that BPR parkland acres per capita currently exceeds the Trust for Public Lands median level of service for urban parkland. And even with an increasing population in the year 2040, that will still be true, will still be higher than the median average or the median level of service. And Boulder also has 43,000 acres of OSMP space just outside the city that offers community members additional places to get outdoors. Um, so um, that's the good news in terms of parkland, in terms of proximity to neighborhood parks and playgrounds, which is a second metric that BPR uses, the department's meeting the standards of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. That being said, when considering equity and resilience, as Regina mentioned, as lenses um, to view services, exploring the use of additional metrics based on community values to supplement existing measures could, we think could be very useful. And many cities across the country are exploring um, this, looking at new and tailored ways to measure a level of service because every community is different. Um, and two examples of metrics that we think could be used to provide a more comprehensive picture of level of service include accessibility and quality of facilities. For example, 
You might be near a park, but is it easy to get to? Do you have to cross a highway um, in really dense areas of the city? Um, just being close to a park might not be enough. Um, a neighborhood park could be close, but can you walk there in 15 minutes or so or ride your bike or take transit? Um, is it accessible to people with ability or mobility issues? Is park signage in more than one language? Those are just a few questions we could ask um, under accessibility. And in terms of quality, do facilities offer the things surrounding community members need? Um, are they well designed and maintained? So we think looking at selecting a combination of metrics to measure future level of service can help establish a more complete and comprehensive understanding of level of service based on community values. Um, address current and future gaps more meaningfully and help the city better serve diverse and changing needs. And then Regina, you could go to the next slide, please. So with those thoughts in mind and looking to you for policy direction, we have a couple of questions. Um, so the first question, is a lower number of acres of parkland per capita metric acceptable? And following that, should BPR focus on metrics related to equity of access considerations? So we'd love to hear what you all think. So please let us know. Okay, this is the time for folks to raise their hand and weigh in. Uh, maybe I'll kick us off, Sarah, with a question back for you. You mentioned that there's a um, that there's a nationwide standard out there that measures um, acres per capita, um, both of developed land and undeveloped land. Can you um, shoot those numbers out to us? Do you have those off the top of your head? Um, I don't have them right off the top of my head, um, but I can find them um, okay. and come back to that. Okay, um, that's that's fine. While you're doing that, we've got a couple of hands up. Um, Aaron, do you want to weigh in on this one? Sure, um, I'll, I'll say that uh, I think the, the primary thing that we need to focus on is uh, access to quality uh, parks and recreation facilities rather than the acres per capita. I th so I think you're going in the right direction here. I, in, my experience over the course of my lifetime, I, I, I don't know if it's ever happened that I've gone to a park and it's been too crowded for me to enjoy. Uh, so, but but having a park not be nearby definitely means that, that you know, I or someone else might not go use it. So within limits, I think um, it's, it's fine to focus on the uh, access uh, rather than the per capita number. And I also really like where you're going with the equity of access, not just as the crow flies, but, you know, is there a, you know, if, if the park is right across Foothills Parkway, you know, you can't just walk to it, right? So, um, and also uh, looking at um, access for our, some of our underserved and lower income populations would be important as well. So I, I like where you're going. Thanks, Aaron. We've got uh, Mark, then Mary, then Sam. Mark? Yeah, um, by the way, if my notes are correct, I think our numbers are at about 18.59 per thousand. Um, that, that may or may not be correct. I'm not a great note taker. Um, I, Mark, you, I'll chime in and just add, you, you nailed it. Our current acres per capita is 18. The TPL median, the Trust for Public Land median is 13. 13, yes. And the, for our benchmarks, it's 17. So we're above both the TPL median and the benchmarks. When you, my, my question is, when you develop these, these metrics, um, do you take into account in, in any way the fact that we have the 43,000 acres of open space. Um, and Westminster has, um, Westminster's ratio is 26.52 per, per thousand. Okay, but I would be hard pressed to say that they are better off than we are um, because we have open space. And I know it's separate facilities, separate uses, um, and, and there's not you know, a perfect overlap but um, shouldn't that factor in in some way in, in how we view um, our resources? I'll, I'll chime in, this is Jeff. Uh, Mark, that's a great point. And I would say that that does factor in. Um, you know, what, what we try to do is look at, I'll just use the metaphor apples to apples, you know, oranges to oranges. So. When we measure park land, we're really looking at those amenities and kind of the intended use and purpose of those parks. Um, do they have play areas? Do they have multi-use fields? Do they have those types of facilities that support the community 
through all the benefits that, that parks provide our community. Um, and so when we look at the, the metrics and the, the data, we're trying to stick with those kind of similar properties and, and areas with, within parks. Um, but it, it, you're correct. That's why Sarah mentioned it. You know, at the end of the day, we do have a much larger amount of open space, which is a, a whole different type of use, um, more natural, passive type of recreation. Um, but we're trying to achieve at least uh, those median numbers, uh, similar to other communities where we do provide our residents those specific park amenities. And I'll, I'll let the other team um, chime in as well. That, that covers it for me, thank you. Yep. Great, thanks Martin, thanks Jeff. We have uh, Mary and then Sam. Thanks Bob. Um, yeah, I would agree with what Aaron stated. And to that, I would just add, uh, and I think I've brought this up last time that we touched on this topic. Um, you're, you're talking about accessibility or access in term in its five dimensions, um, which is the, you know, accessibility certainly is one of the dimensions, but you're also talking um, about the availability, which is the metric that you've been using um, the accommodations such as signage in, in Spanish and acceptability, how welcoming is it, and affordability, which, you know, ex these parks are generally um, don't have fees associated with them. So um, just to make sure that we cover those five dimensions as we're looking um, going forward. Thanks, Mary. Sam, you're up. My turn to do that mute thing. Um, <clears throat> so it looks to me like we're pretty good out through 2040 um, from the metric of acres per thousand residents. So I think it's probably appropriate to be looking at other things. It doesn't look like that's the main driver for us. In addition to all the equity considerations Mary just put out there, all of which I think are um, well worth tracking closely and kind of a, a better way of looking at things. I think one of the points that um, we hear about is what amenities are around like ball fields. And so another thing to think about might be, you know, something like number of ball fields per thousand residents, or, you know, you can list whatever the amenities are that people like soccer fields, softball fields, and so on, and track that as well and see how we're doing relative to the median. So rather than it just be, you know, kind of a gross acres per thousand residents, uh, are the amenities what people are asking for and how are we doing with those relative to the median? So I think, you know, parks are very different than open space. And so for density relief, I think all those acres of open space are very helpful. But as far as the amenities available, that's a different question. And I think that's another area to be looking at in addition to the equity concern. But generally, to me, it looks like for the scope of this master plan, acres per res acres per thousand residents is not you know, a, a big flag at the moment. That's it, Bob, thanks. Thanks, Sam. And I'll, I'll jump in here, then I have, we have Adam, I think. Um, I, I, when I was on the Parks Board about 10 years ago when we last did a master plan, and I, I do remember, uh, as, as Sam indicates, um, there were a lot of metrics. It wasn't just acres per 100,000 people. It was number of dog parks per 100,000 people. It was number of ball fields. And I suspect that in this master plan that you all are putting together, we'll have a lot of those metrics. And, and uh, the, the one I, that, I, that stuck out for me a decade ago was uh, was uh, dog parts per 100,000. I think the, uh, the National Trust uh, number was, the average was one per 100,000. And at, at that point in time, we had three. So we were, we were killing in, in that area. And I suspect as Sam observes, we're killing in some other areas as well. So um, I'm with, with the prior, prior speakers. I, I don't think we need to focus exclusively on um, number of acres. We should also focus on some of the other amenities we provide. And if somehow we can uh, notate um, at least near, near in open space, maybe that's just a footnote in your master plan, uh, open space that's readily accessible to people um, in walking distance or short bike ride, that would be nice to note as well. We've got Adam and then uh, and then Rachel. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm going to travel down the path Sam started, and that is about particular amenities we don't have very many of, um, particularly in the lens of equity. So, you know, we only have one major reservoir. We only have one 
golf course, but those are also pretty high fee areas. And that's a little bit concerning going forward because there aren't other opportunities or options within the city to partake in those activities, especially for people with lower incomes. So we have to make sure we balance access in those very unique resources um, with what people are capable of paying. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, just following up on some previous points around open space, and I'm sorry if this was tucked into the presentation and I just missed it, um, but when we are looking at equitable access, do we look at like if you've, and I guess flowing from like, a, I think Aaron's example of got across Foothills Highway to get to a park, if you've got open space out your back door, say, versus you live somewhere where there's no open space, no park nearby, and you have to cross the highway, is that all sort of factored in and looked at? Because it sounds like we sort of um, have a, a discrete box that we're looking at with parks and rec and then separately open space. So just wondering if, if those two come together as you're looking at the equitable access question. Maybe that's to Allie, I don't know who to direct it to. Yeah, no, I can take that. Here's the, the the simple answer is yes. Historically, proximity just looked at a radius from a location and, and was there access. The more nuanced, nuanced and better work is to say, is it truly accessible? To your point, is there a highway in the way or if an area? So when when Sarah mentioned earlier that we meet proximity standards, that's when we include HOAs and schoolyards, right? So we really are thinking about, we don't care who's providing the playground. Do kids have free and easy access to a playground? Um, we haven't taken that nuanced look for parkland, but I do think that would be the next work if this is the approach we're going to take where we look at quality of amenities rather than acres per capita. And when you say parkland, do you mean open space land? Both. I would be public lands, right? And then to the other nuanced point, there is a conversation around amenities, right? Playgrounds is one we've already discussed, but when you look across the different, and in, in, in the needs assessment is the chart Bob is remembering about our rec facilities and where we stand up when it comes to dog parks and diamond ball fields and other things. Um, that's on page 26 of the of the needs assessment. You'll see that we're all over the place when it comes to those amenities. So the, the short answer to your question is, Rachel, is yes, we would want people to have access to some type of land. We would wanna consider what amenities, you know, this is where 15 minute neighborhoods and that more or nuanced evaluation of what is available is important. And that's part of the next work. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, I, I, I'll just add to that too, in terms of like GIS and mapping, like we can overlay a lot of those different metrics and then see where there are gaps. Um, and, you know, we worked on a plan oh, recently in Vancouver where they did that, you know, they were interested in certain things so we could turn on layers and, um, and like Ali said, a more nuanced and just kind of more um, comprehensive look at exactly what kind of parkland and what do they have and are, are the things in that park meeting the needs of the surrounding community, not just, you know, based on benchmark communities um, and just number. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. Great. I don't see any other hands up. So let's move on to the next question. Sarah, you're on mute. If I had a dollar. <laughs> so the second question relates to amenities. Um, and then just before I dive into the question, I wanna mention we did talk to Prab um, and we've prioritized the options that I'll read off based on an understanding of ease of implementation, capacity of BPR, community desire, and meeting the goal of providing adequate amenities to everyone in the community. Um, and so I'll read the question and just a reminder that they're in rank order um, based on what we know and we wanna hear what you think. So the question is, which of the following options pro for providing new park amenities are the most impactful or the most beneficial to the community? And are there any that should not be prioritized or raise any flags with you? So A, ensure existing facilities are more resilient and built to support higher use. B, partner with other public entities such as school districts or municipalities to develop joint use facilities. C, plan and potentially construct future phases of existing parks. 
D, repurpose existing park sites to include more or different types of amenities to fill current gaps and future gaps. E, partner with private organizations to develop facilities and programs or allow Boulder residents to use those facilities. F, purchase additional land for parks to be built on. So we wanna know what you think of these options, um, so. And Sarah, those were prioritized by um, staff and PRAB, is that right, from A through F? Yeah, and based on community feedback, staff, and then, you know, Allie and Jeff and Regina and Morgan, you know, their thoughts based on working every day with staff. Okay, and so you're looking for for council to weigh in on, on whether there's some things there that are missing from this or whether the, uh, the rank ordering should be different or even, even if there's some things that should be eliminated entirely, is that right? Yes, all of the Great. above. Great. Yeah. Uh, I see Sam with his hand up. See, it turned off my mute button before starting speaking. It's a new thing. Um, <clears throat> so I have a question, really. I, I believe that we have a large amount of land available in the planning reserve that is technically owned by parks. And what I'm curious about uh, for your question 2F is, are we land limited? I mean, that land is all in the planning reserve, so it's not really accessible in the short term, but in the medium to long term it is. So I guess my real question is, is there a need for additional land um, writ large? Like, can you speak about that? Because um, it seems like that is a kind of entry level question because land in Boulder is very expensive. And so if we could take F, mostly off the list or keep it down at this low priority, it seems like there's more resources than for the other things. So I guess, could you just riff a little bit on our need for land and how we plan to use the planning reserve to, to meet some of that? I, I can touch on that. Um, that's actually a really good question. And we've heard that similar um, consideration from our Parks and Rec Advisory Board and others. Um, and, the, and the quick answer um, is that we are limited in land. And that's where, you know, it's kind of a uh, similar question to the first one, where if we look strictly at park acreage and how many acres of parkland do we have, you know, you, that's where Sarah showed the chart that we are going to see a, a decline in how many acres we can provide our, our residents as the population might increase. Um, and so we do have limited abilities, you're correct. As we all know, land in Boulder is at a premium. Um, and so that's why this list was somewhat generated and populated to look at alternative ways to provide those new park amenities or new parks. Um, and so, yeah, the, the Area 3 planning reserve, um, you all might remember most recently during some of the CU South discussions, I believe a couple of years ago, we, we started uh, engaging city council and kind of looking at that area in particular um, it is a large amount of land um, in area three that, that is set aside for, for future park use. And I, and I will say that that amount of property was taken into consideration with that am amount of available parkland acres. So Sam, just you know, to your point, that, that number that, that we mentioned earlier does um, assume that that parkland would be developed at some point. Um, but in the meantime, it, it really comes down to just as everyone was mentioning, what are the amenities that are provided? Um, what is the proximity that people have to parks? So there's kind of different metrics um, instead of just simply additional acreage or additional land, if, if that starts to support the, or answer the question. Yeah, it begins to answer the question. I mean, I guess to me, <clears throat> it seems like since there is, I believe, almost a couple hundred acres available. I don't know what parks portion of that is, but it's a large portion of that. It seems like there's plenty there for one big regional park and maybe some neighborhood serving types of parks there. Um, so I guess I'll just answer this, this question. It seems to me like the two most important for me are A and C like resilient existing facilities that take care of what you you already own and make it you know substantially uh, robust going forward for both you know climate impacts but also use impacts as our population goes up and then planning and constructing future phases I think most of what I hear from council for um, folks not finding enough um, of what they're looking for at parks has a lot to do with 
types of things that are not offered or not offered close to them. So things like soccer fields and ball fields, pickleball, you know, things of that nature. So it seems to me that of these, the preserve and make more resilient existing facilities and go forward with future phases that we already have planned that people have expectations built around. And then I guess I would deprioritize additional land, um, given that I think we have quite a bit and we're well above the mark, you know, for the kind of raw uh, land per thousand people. And then partnering with other public entities, I mean, I think that's important in coordinating with open space, probably first and foremost. And you've heard that and you, you understand that. And we obviously don't build improvements on open space, but to the extent that some of the desired uh, amenities are available in open space, um, whatever they may be, we certainly don't need to repeat those and we can lean on open space to, to emphasize those. But I find A and C in this list of six to be the most important. Thanks, Sam. Mary. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'll start with a question about um, the about E partnering with private organizations, and in the typical, uh, I guess, what what is envisioned in terms of partnering with private organizations um, by way of examples. Ali, do you want to touch on that? Sure. Uh, there's lots of ways that parks across the United States are using public private partnerships to, to not only develop facilities, but to operate them. Examples are things as simple as the Central Park Conservancy, right? That's a, a New York City park, one of our nation's most well-known parks, but it's operated by the Central Park Conservancy. And so there are um, many models like that across the country where there is some type of a, you know, private doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a not-for-profit, but they're operated by some kind of a partner. Um, and so Public entities, you know, you nailed it. You talk about OSMP, BVSD is a really important one for us as well, and we're updating our joint use agreement. But for private organizations, it could be private or not for profit. When you look at partnering for either development or operations, did that help, Mary? Yeah, it does. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if if it, there's a possibility that we could kind of expand how we think about private organizations in terms of, say, for example. Um, I know that there are um, folks out there that don't feel welcome in the rec centers, say, for example. And so they go and they start their own um, little business. Um, and the particular one I'm thinking about is um, Zumba, and you're familiar with this one, Allie. Um, and, and then do it, find a place where they can have really cheap rent and then just conduct these classes. Um, so in terms of thinking differently about that is thinking about entrepreneurs, such as in this particular case, who you know, see a need out there and then fulfill it. And how can their entrepreneurship that touches on a community that's underserved um, be leveraged to provide um, that, that amenity uh, by way of classes or whatever um, to folks that for whatever reason, you know, don't feel so welcome in, in our rec centers. And so would it be, um, and then so it could be such that they go out to different sites. Um, I'm thinking about like Boulder Housing Partner sites. Um, a lot of the, the BHP sites have really nice community centers. And sure. so to, to provide classes in those spaces, but to think a little bit differently about who these private organizations are. Um, not just like the ones that you mentioned, but, you know, small, small, small um, little businesses that are just there to meet an identified need. Um, so so that's, that's one thought. Um, I'll agree with Sam about the priorities, um, but I also think that partnering with public entities and specifically like other municipalities. Um, and this kind of touches on what we'll probably be talking about in a little while, um, the, the financial piece of it, where um, 
or, or whether or not people who don't live in Boulder should pay a higher rent uh, or a higher fees to, and to use the amenities. Um, maybe there's some partnership with um, other municipalities that, that we can play off of in order to make that work in a better way, um, such that we're not charging people higher fees that work here or, you know, um, that want to use the facilities. I know that a lot of people do drive into Boulder, like, for example, from Lyons to use our pools because there's nothing there. Um, so just to, I, I think that one is an important one for me to, to look at the partnerships with other public entities and then um, to think differently about um, how, what private organization means. Um, but other than, other than that, I, I guess I would put purchase additional land for parks last um, in this stack, just as you have it. So that's all I have, thank you. Great, I don't see any other hands. I'm gonna agree with Mary's last statement. I, I, I say purchase additional land for parks is probably my lowest priority as well. All the other things above, as Sam and Mary have already said, are um, high priorities and we can argue over what's first, second, or third, but I think these are things that we should uh, all, all be doing in, in parallel. Uh, anyone else on this question? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, folks, take it away. Regina, could you switch the next slide, please? Great. Good evening, good evening everybody. My name is Eric Rongold and I'm with Design Workshop. So for the next theme, taking care of what we have, um, this theme remains a very important value uh, to the Boulder community. As part of the master plan update process, the community was surveyed on how they would choose to allocate $100 for competing parks related priorities. The community chose to allocate 48 of the $100 to maintaining and renovating existing facilities versus only $27 to acquire parkland and construct new facilities. This indicates a strong desire that BPR's focus should remain on maintaining existing facilities as well as renovating and enhancing existing facilities. The importance of maintaining existing assets becomes increasingly critical given the fact that parks and recreation facilities are having to work harder uh, to accommodate the city's growing population and outside visitors. Next slide, please. Well, BPR has done a great job at prioritizing funding for capital maintenance and improvement. Uh, additional funds are required in order to meet industry best practices for capital expenditures. As part of the 2016 strategic capital plan, BPR established the current replacement value of this asset portfolio. Since 2016, the current replacement value of BPR's assets uh, have increased due to the construction of new facilities, cost inflation within the construction industry, material cost increases, and an overall better understanding of assets since the 2016 plan. Using, uh, the BP using BPR's updated 2021 CRV, its current maintenance backlog of, a, of approximately $20.5 million, uh, we can calculate an updated FCI or facility condi condition index of 0 0.068. This score places BPR in the good to excellent range of the FCI scoring criteria. BPR's updated 2021 CRV numbers also enable the department to set new goals around annual capital maintenance and improvement spend using the industry benchmark of two to 3% of current asset values. And this benchmark is something that's seen across a variety of different industries and was set uh, in the late 90s by the Academy of Engineering, Science and Medicine. Using this benchmark, BPR will need to spend approximately six to $9 million on capital each year, significantly higher than the department's current expenditures of four to $6 million per year, if the department is to maintain the current condition of assets. The table shown on this slide illustrates BPR's capital shortfall each year when adjusted for updated 2021 capital expenditure goals. Based on updated CIP information through 2027, in almost every year, BPR will fall short of its minimum capital expenditure goal. Next slide, please. So with this in mind, uh, our question for you all is, should BPR continue prioritizing and maintaining and enhancing existing assets first while providing new amenities as funding opportunities become available? 
Okay, folks, this is our third of six questions. I see uh, Mark's hand up first. Just a quick question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, what accounts for the uh, sharp drop off in projected expense, uh, expenditures in 2025? Jumps back up again in 2026. It just sort of sticks out there. What, that, uh, what is going on in 2025 that uh, causes our expenditures to drop precipitously? So the fluctuation that you see is a direct response to how much BPR has budgeted for capital expenditure in that year. So because capital expenditures vary on a yearly basis, the extent to which the shortfall or the size of the shortfall is relative to that year's capital expenditure. 2025 in particular has a lower budgeted capital expenditure than prior years, which is why you see that jump. But is there something that causes that? I mean, there ought to be something to which that drop is attributable. Can you tell me what that might be? I'll, I'll chime in to clarify, Mark. It's just based on the project spend in any given year. So the funding, Parks and Rec often will stockpile capital to fund the larger, more expensive projects. An example is the Flatirons Golf Course, right? So in the years preceding it, we spent less and that money stayed in fund balance in the permanent Parks and Recreation and 0.25 funds so that we could spend it when it was time to do the project. And so it's not a reflection of funding. The funding is consistent. It's, you know, based on, it's the spending that fluctuates based on the projects that we can handle in any given year. Thank you, Ellie. that's a good answer. Uh, can we go to the next slide then? Back to the question. Um, since I've, I've got the floor for a moment, um, my answer to that would be uh, yes. Um, that, that one seems rather simple to me. Uh, the funding is available. You know, by all means, uh, you know, expand opportunities, and expand facilities, uh, but until that occurs, I think the priority has to be maintaining and enhancing existing assets. That would be how I view it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. We have Adam, Mirabai, and then Rachel. Adam. Thanks, Bob. I agree with Mark's take, but I have a question in return. Um, I realize that our expenditures just to maintain what we have are going to continually go up. What are the anticipated funding mechanisms to meet those needs? Adam, are you asking how we plan to address increased O&M costs yes. in, in the face of capital? That's one of the strategies we're going to have to develop. If you think of our key themes, financial sustainability is the next one that we're talking about. And we do have a lot of hard conversations because, as you note, O&M costs are rising for both parkland and recreation services. Um, and, and we do need to develop a new financial strategy. We don't have the answers right now. We have a lot of questions, a few tonight, and even more as we go into the next phase of the master plan. And are we going to talk about that in the next question? I, or otherwise, I'll say a piece right now. Financial sustainability is the next theme, and we do have questions about how to allocate funding and spending as we look to the future. Awesome. I will hold off until then. Thank you, Ellie. Great. We have, uh, thanks, uh, Adam. We have uh, Mirabai and uh, Rachel. So yes to this question. I think that the biggest cost to me is, is building and working on a facility in the first place. So if we already have those, um, I think maintaining it is going to be the next important thing because if we don't, then you have to start over from scratch and that's a huge outlay. So I think as uh, the funds are available, that's going to be the most important thing is taking care of what we currently have. And I think that's one thing in this world that a lot of people don't do. And that's why we have so much waste. So I, I strongly support number three. Thanks, Mirabai. Uh, Rachel, you're the last hand up. Yep, just a quick yes as well on this. That's all. Great. Anybody else? That was an easy one. Back to you guys. Thank you. So this chart illustrates BPR's total revenues and expenditures by year since 2016. Uh, just as a note, this chart does not include capital expenditures due to their year-by-year -year variability. BPR's fund revenues have remained almost entirely flat since 2016, with a total average annual growth rate of negative 0.4%. Meanwhile, BPR's expenditures continue to rise, with a total average increase of 0.35% since 2016. These increases in expenditures are due to rapidly rising personnel, maintenance, energy, materials, and operations costs, 
as well as aging infrastructure and facilities and an overall growing demand for parks and recreation amenities. While BPR has increased cost recovery targets and fees methodically, the existing imbalance of fund revenues versus expenditures pose a risk to the future financial sustainability of the department. Next slide, please. The trend of uh, rising departmental expenditures versus flat fund revenues is projected to increase through 2026. Through 2026, BPR's expenditures are projected to increase on average 5.8%, while projected funding is only expected to increase on average 2.8%. The imbalance added to the funds required to meet the 2021 CRV repair and replacement goals and annual operations and maintenance spend goals, $20.5 million in backlog maintenance, and $177.9 million in unfunded capital projects creates a future situation in which BPR will be increasingly challenged to continue to serve the community and operate its facilities in a financially sustainable way. To mitigate flat revenues and rising expenditures, BPR must be prepared to identify and implement other revenue generating activities, strategies, and possible partnerships in the coming years to both supplement its current funding sources and enable the department to continue to offer high quality facilities and programming to the community. Next slide, please. So with that, to maintain financial sustainability, are there any options listed below that should not be prioritized? And of the options listed below, which should be explored further? Reevaluate subsidy provision and allocation determination, reduce services, increase fees for select programs or demographics, seek a combination of new funding and fee adjustments, implement high fee programs or facilities, increase fees for all or other alternatives not yet considered. So these questions just get tougher and tougher, don't they? Um, so, uh, I don't see any hands up, so I'll, I'll just kind of jump in here. Uh, one thing I remember back when I was in the Parks Board, uh, Jane Brodigan uh, was was um, ruthless about programs uh, paying for themselves, and and our our least um, profitable program was the Pottery Lab at the time. It was beloved, but the Pottery Lab was one that uh, we lost uh, we lost money every time somebody walked in the door. And so um, rather than shut down the program, uh, which uh, was not particularly popular with the community, it was actually outsourced. There was a nonprofit that um, agreed to pick it up and uh, con continues to run it to this day, Studio Arts. Um, they um, do fundraising because they're a nonprofit. They can go out and ask for money where the city generally can't. Uh, they still charge for their, for their classes, uh, but it seems to be a success story. And I guess the question for for the parks department is are there are there other programs out there that um, are um, not quite um, paying for themselves that you all are thinking about either either shutting down or or um, like the pottery lab outsourcing to a nonprofit that might be able to do a better job at it i'll take that one bob so since 2014 we have spun off many programs to to community partners that either specialize or have more capacity there are many examples boat rentals at the boulder reservoir are offered in partnership with rocky mountain paddle you mentioned studio arts boulder we have a booster club that runs the competitive elements of our gymnastics program we have um, spun off dance so that a community partner is providing the recreational level dance in partnership with us while doing more competitive aspects on their own there is no more low-hanging fruit, not even low hanging fruit. It took a lot of work to get there. Um, that we don't have a stockpile of programs that we think we should be spinning off. And actually, um, as we review the needs assessment, I actually think there are gaps in the community that we should be filling. And so in my opinion, when it comes to service delivery, where we really need to be looking is where you started is, are our programs paying for themselves? Are the ones that are providing community benefit, getting the right amount of subsidy? And, and that's what's most important next. And I, I do think at this point, we have spun off the, the programs that we have or discontinued programs that we should, where there's either so much redundancy in the community or it's just not something we were doing well and it wasn't worth it. Thanks, Sally. We have uh, Mirabai, then um, Adam. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, Ali, can you explain to me um, under D, it says, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, under C, increase fees for select programs or demographics. What do you guys mean by demographics? Does it mean 
Um, right there, right off the top of my head, I would think of age-based. So right now we have age-based discounts for youth and seniors. Adults pay full cost recovery. We could pursue a policy direction if that was of interest to folks where, where adults are paying cost recovery plus in order to generate more subsidy. In our last planning process, uh, the community told us that they did not think that fee should be providing subsidy. However, I think that's an important conversation to be having now amidst our that, that last graph you saw where the growth in in expenses is outpacing the growth in revenues, even when we have tried to methodically and carefully increase fees. So, okay. Um, so I get, now that I understand that, I mean, I guess the only thing I would, yes, I'm fine if you guys look into that. And most of this, I'm fine if you look into, I guess the biggest thing I'd be interested in looking into as well. And I don't know, again, the percentage, and I'm sorry, maybe I missed, missed seeing that on a graph, um, but the, the, the cost to people who are outside of the city, because again, a lot of our residents are paying taxes and, and whatnot. And I know that a lot of times um, residents who are in the county have to pay a higher rate to use the uh, rec, rec facilities and whatnot. But, you know, if, again, even people who are coming from areas that are outside of even Boulder County, because, because maybe their area is not providing the, the resources. So, I mean, that's one thing I don't know if you guys are looking at, but if we could open it up to even, and you know, looking at it that way, because that's one thing like with open space, I've always wanted to tax people who are not city um, residents on on that because it's putting a strain on the system. So that'd be interested in. And then um, you said implement high fee, uh, fee programs or facilities. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure, that would be building on the other model that where we talked about where you could have specific de demographics that are playing cost recovery plus you could implement programs. I'll give a, a, a really easy example is um, more and more golf facilities are adding simulators, a, a size down approach of the whole top golf thing and those would be revenue generating is that a business that we should not specifically that but that's an example of things um, organizations do to generate revenue. Okay, perfect. That that clears it up. Then, then yeah, then I I would say I'd be open at least to researching A through G on on my part. So, thanks, Mirabai. Um, we have Adam, Sam, Rachel, and Aaron. Adam, thank you, Bob. Um, while I don't want to count anything out, I am worried about the idea of our parks and rec services um, being run like a business to some degree, where we end up having these tiers where access is dictated based on how much you pay. And that just doesn't feel super good to me. You know, I, I wanna keep as wide and diverse a set of uh, programs and different uses as possible. And I understand that they that's gonna require fee increases, but I think those fee increases, we should just be as upfront as possible about when they're coming and time them so that they're small increases every year rather than big increases every five or something to the point where a program is going to get totally just axed because you know they had five good years and now the prices are unsustainable for them so um i just really want any fee increases to try to be as transparent as possible as planned for as possible and uh in as small increments as possible Thanks, Adam. We have Sam, Rachel, Aaron, and Mary. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> um, I think it's interesting to go back to the how would people spend $100 question because I think there's some clues in there. And, you know, a quarter of it was to remove financial barriers for underrepresented communities. And then another quarter of it was maintain what we have. And so I think those are two really important pointers for this question. So how so? Um, I think, you know, I don't know how we do means testing and financial assistance, but I think writ large, if we do a good job of supporting folks who have limited means or more limited means, then I think increasing fees kind of across the board makes sense. So assuming that we've gotten rid of most of the big money losing programs so that we have fees relatively balanced with costs, um, I don't see a real problem increasing fees if you do it the way Adam suggested, as long as what we're doing is being careful that we're not pricing 
pricing people out of our services. So I think, you know, first and foremost, that needs to be kept in mind. And it's clear from the how to spend $100 that people are willing to pay more, you know, to be able to make sure that everyone has access. So I guess I, I'm not Personally, I don't think it's clear that we shouldn't increase fees as costs go up. We should, but we should do so in a way that we support the folks who don't have the money to manage the fee increases as well. So I don't know what that looks like. Um, this isn't really an area that I've got a lot of uh, confidence in. But if you can do that, I think you should avoid reducing services. You know, from from the standpoint that, <clears throat> per Bob's question, we've gotten rid of most stuff that we either don't do well or or is losing money. And so I would. In, in be inclined not to reduce things unless we really are having to put something on the chopping block to make ends meet. So I guess raising fees to me seems like the obvious thing to do. Um, and, you know, for demographics, I think it's who can pay best. And so I think, you know, generally it's hard to, to sort. So your adult sorting makes sense, right? But I think we have to couple that with good support for people uh, of limited means. Um, I'm also kind of interested in the way Mary teed up the charging people from other communities. I think we really should be charging people who aren't paying taxes here more than people who are paying taxes here with the caveat that if we can come up with exchange programs where another community like Westminster has more of X you know, service and amenity than we do, and we have more why than they do, is there a way that we can have their users use those services and our users use the services that they have? So generally, okay with increasing fees, as long as we're watching out for people who have less means, generally okay with charging folks from out of the city more money, but also very interested in exploring kind of exchange or not duplicating services that others have nearby. And that's all, thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. We have uh, Rachel, Aaron, and Mary. Thanks, Bob. I think I'm um, pretty aligned with Sam on this. Um, I would prefer not to reduce services, B, if possible. Um, I think one of the things that's great about the rec centers is it is one stop shopping, you know, you get your, your annual pass and you can, um, you know, do from yoga to pick up all the swimming to gymnastics. So it is, I think, great if we can keep a, a robust um, slate of services. Um, I am very worried about the, uh, I'm sure it's on the graph that you just showed, but the, the wages for staff that being too low as is right now in the city and that resulting in us not being able to, um, open some pools, we couldn't hire lifeguards and, and staff, right? So I think that's part of the financial sustainability piece. Um, and and I think we need to be able to, to pay staff a livable and competitive wage. Um, so for that reason, I think it does make sense to look at um, some high fee programs and facilities that might keep us competitive. Um, so I appreciate Adam Adam's point that we don't wanna turn into a for-profit model, but it seems like we have to um, have some way to pay for this to be sustainable and to be able to, to hire um, staff and pay them what they're worth. Um, let's see. And then in terms of, I think, maybe A and C, the subsidies and the fee increases, it, you know, when, when we look at the, the blanket kids and older adults having um, discounts, I think I appreciate the the um the rationale for that but if if somebody is wealthy i'm not sure why they would get 25 percent off you know when when somebody else can't afford to you know who may be a little bit um not able to scrape that money together then they can't come in so i i would suggest that we have it more um means tested than just across the board if you are a um a family that can afford it and you know just happen to be under 18 or over 65 or whatever the numbers are i'm not sure that makes a lot of sense to me so that's all my feedback thanks thanks rachel we have aaron mary and then i'll go thanks um yeah i thought uh, sam's comments were were right on target so i pretty much agree uh, with all of those um, thanks for that sam and um and also the mirror vice point about the out of city residence was was a good one it seems like a reasonable place to potentially um, increase some fees, um, subject to Sam's caveat about uh, possible exchanges. 
Um, I think, and as well as Rachel's bit about the um, higher income folks that you know, maybe we don't, maybe we means test some of those discounts. Uh, and of course, it's really important that we, we continue to offer some discounted passes for folks with lower incomes. But one other thing, I'll, additional comment I'll just add is when looking at the high fee program or facility, just to make sure that there's not like a, a segregation of you know users of our of our uh, facilities based on income, uh, like just like imagine opening a super cool new splash park in a rec center that costs like fifty bucks a day, and like all the little kids are like, oh, I want to go do that thing, and the parents are like, yeah, we can't afford that one, like. You know, so uh, I think we want to be careful to the extent that we add those that they're that they're ones that are you know not creating real disparities in terms of access and from um, things that would be kind of universally interesting to um, everybody. I'm not expressing that perfectly, but uh, just the sense of may maybe it's off to one side or you go there separately or I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, but uh, we, I just think we need to be careful about uh, how we might approach that. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron, uh, Mary, Mark, and then Bob. Thank you, Bob. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a public service comment about how the picture that was just painted here with respect to um, the financial sustainability, in particular, um, capital maintenance costs, repeats itself over and over across most all departments within the city. And I cannot stress that enough, and I cannot stress enough the dire need um, that is within all the departments. Um, as, like I said, this picture repeats itself across the whole city, which is why the Financial Strategies Committee um, recommended the 10%. I'll leave it at that. Um, but I will support what the rest of my colleagues have said to this point. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Mark and Bob. Now, I, I want to second what, what Mary just said uh, strongly. Um, in terms of the specifics of this department, I, I need to say that, that this is a conversation we've had with respect to other departments. Uh, we could have the same conversation with respect to almost any department in the city. Um, and, you know, we, we simply don't have the resources to do everything for all people at all times, uh, especially if we want to uh, protect those who are most vulnerable and, and, and insulate them from price increases, which I think is, a, is something we need to do. So my basic comment on, on uh, this number four is all of the above. Um, I would obviously like to reduce services least of, of these alternatives. But I'm not sure anything can be off the table um, because um, the, the cavalry is not coming over the hill to rescue us here. We are a very, very high uh, sales tax town. Um, we are a high property tax town. Um, and we have services that we want to provide and, and probably more services than we possibly can provide. So I, I'm not sure I'd eliminate anything. I would obviously like to reduce services the least. Um, I think uh, if we can properly structure fee increases, and I, I want to reference Adam's comment that they be transparent and gradual when, where possible so people understand what's happening. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I second Sam's comments on uh, trying to protect those who are economically more disadvantaged and, and more vulnerable. Um, but with those caveats, I would not take anything off the table, although I put reduce services in smaller print. Um, but other than that, everything needs to be uh, discussed uh, and looked at because, uh, you know, th this is an ongoing conversation on a department by department basis. And uh, these are simply the financial realities we have to grapple with. And again, I want to thank Mary for raising that, that the, the issue of um, funding uh, our capital needs, um, and I support everything that she said on that. So those are my comments. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and I'll go last. I, I want to echo pretty much everything that's been said. I don't think that there's a lot of inconsistency among council members. We do have some pretty big capital needs. Uh, we'll be talking about those over the next few weeks. We already have. 
Um, with respect to programs, um, which I think was what this question really focuses on, um, I do agree with with Sam that uh, subject to um, subject to ensuring that we are providing affordability for uh, families in need, that we do continue to increase fees. I agree with uh, Adam that uh, gradual increases are better than than dramatic ones, uh, uh, intermittent. Um, I agree with a statement by Maribai that um, out of city residents um, should pay a higher fee uh, for programs um, unless we have a special deal and then there's a reciprocity arrangement. But absent reciprocity, I think that um, in, in in city residents who are paying taxes and subsidizing a lot of these services should uh, receive the first price break. Um, one thing we haven't talked a whole lot about is ad revenue. Um, I know that we have some pretty um, tight rules when it comes to advertising, but I would hope that the Parks Department would continue to look at advertising as a source of revenue. It can be a, a good source of revenue. Um, some people find that distasteful to ha have um, the name of a company uh, affiliated with a, a service and, and maybe it's something we don't want to do but i hope that we don't uh, completely foreclose that because that is a good potential source of revenues a lot of cities do it a lot of cities will um, allow branding of their various uh, city amenities including their park services and we should um, at least explore that uh, within within boundaries of, of taste and then finally um ali mentioned uh, alternative revenue sources I think there are some great revenue sources out there, um, things that are that have a very high return on investment. My brother happens to um, operate a, uh, a golf simulator uh, shop in New Jersey, um, and for $60 an hour, you can come in and you can have your swing analyzed, or you can uh, play just about any course in the world, including St. Andrews, um, and they make about $59 per hour on it. Uh, it is just a highly, highly profitable business, and those types of businesses and those types of partnerships are certainly things that the Parks Department should look at, uh, whether they're branded or the, whether they're just simply um, a uh, white labeled uh, service where um, there is a, a guaranteed return on investment and where we can provide a service to our community and also make money to subsidize some of the programs that um, are not quite as profitable. I think I don't see any other hands. I think everyone's weighed in on this question. So a good, good uh, generator of, uh, of ideas here. Let's move on to the last two questions. Thank you. Does City Council have recommendations or preferences of funding sources for initiatives that support city climate goals? And I, I can give a little background on this question. It's kind of abrupt, but you know, a lot of the work we do and we have an overall lens of resilience and a focus on our climate uh, with the climate emergency. And so a lot of the work we do, whether it's capital or our operations and programs, relate to those cities climate uh, our city's climate goals and so as an example like when we redo a recreation center or enhance a pool you know if we're looking for new infrastructure or new innovation and in how we reduce energy consumption and those sorts of things that's typically um, paid uh, with just our our typical funding sources that we do all capital improvements so that's kind of the background is really seeing if council um, has any thoughts or recommendations about specific funding um, for those initiatives. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, any, uh, any way in on that one, Sam? You know, I think the city does a pretty good job at using energy service corporations to, you know, basically fund things for us. They're low cost financing. So I, I think Generally, we do that. So to the extent that we're not looking at ESCOs, we should be using ESCOs. I think that's really a facilities thing. And, and um, beyond that, I guess I would look at pools. You know, um, generally speaking, water takes a lot of energy to heat and cool. And so, you know, how we're managing our pools and I, I think could be one place to look and I guess, you know, another place just thinking about this is how we manage the reservoir, what we do out there with the reservoir. That's another big area that comes to mind. But but largely, I think the the approach that the facilities department has taken at the city is pretty good. Um, if you've got any feedback to that, Jeff, happy to hear it. But I generally have felt like the city's done a good job with this subject. Great, thanks, Sam. Anybody else? 
If not, we'll move on to our final question. Oh, Mary, and then uh, our, then we'll move on to our final question and a wrap up from staff before we finish at 7.30. Mary. Thanks, Bob. No, I just wanted to tag on to what Sam said with respect to pools. And um, Ali, please correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, during the presentations that were made to the Financial Strategy Committee, um, the three pools use up something like 80% of the city's energy um, or, or, or make up 80% of the city's energy expenses. Is that the right percentage? That number sounds very high to me considering waste, you know, other facilities that are high users. I can tell you that pools, as Sam mentioned, it, it is it is energy intensive to heat and treat hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. And we have hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. Um, and so identifying the technology to heat and treat water for a community that loves lap swimming is one of the not only financial challenges we face, but technological challenges. The technology does not currently exist to heat 500,000 gallons of water through renewable resources. Yeah, I think it's about 50% of our natural gas usage comes from some of our pools. I think that's part of the percentage, but uh, I also get confused on the percentages as we go about, so. Okay, well, it was really, really high. And, it's a lot. Um, yeah, it was really, really high. And um, that was one of the, the, the projects that was presented. I think it was presented by facilities as as one of the climate um one of the things that we could do cap capital expense wise um to address to meet our climate goals so i just wanted to bring that up thank you thanks mary um and adam thanks bob uh we've talked about this topic with um medians and um people's front lawns and things but i realize a lot of our park spaces green grass watered, usually non-native species. Um, are we looking into areas that we can have native species that still maintain that, you know, nice uh, park-like aesthetic and the ability to run on it and all that type of stuff um, so we can balance that a little bit more so we have less water intensive uses um, on our park spaces? Absolutely. Our team is actually our urban parks manager. This is a subject he's passionate about. And so in addition to what you said about introducing more native species, you can notice in some of our newer parks, the edges have less maintained manicured areas, right? And so Elks Park, even the new civic area has a lot of areas that have natural plantings. The other thing is that we have entire in, turned over almost the entire system to um, smart irrigation systems that we can control remotely from park operations. They, they, you know, they sense rain when we get it. We, and so it's, it's not just about what's planted. It's about how you operate it. And our team is regularly looking at both. That's really cool. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Sam, bring us home on this one. Yeah. Um, I, I just couldn't resist because Ali, you brought up technology. Um, we have a partnership with Excel, and I'm hopeful that we can do interesting things with that. There are two areas. Um, you, Jeff mentioned natural gas. So immediately I go to one thought is renewable natural gas. Can we figure out a way to do a contract where it comes from anaerobic digesters, which is cow poop, or there's other ways that um, natural gas can be produced or captured in a way that's not fossil. So A, I would look at that. B, heat pumps, right? So, and this is where Excel comes in even more at the top of the list, because one of the challenges with how we heat and cool our buildings is that heat pumps are right on the edge of being economical. And so for homes, anything small, it's hardly worth the capital expense. However, with lots of water and lots of heating needs for water, it sure seems like a heat pump would be more financially feasible. So I would say two things, renewable natural gas and heat pumps would be places that I would think about and I would bring that to the um, partnership team with Excel. I want to chime in with that because Sam, I think those are great ideas. I, as I mentioned before, the technology in this is is new and emerging, and so I do think Boulder is going to have to get comfortable with trying some things and looking for some R and D partnerships, perhaps, to help identify um, technology. It would be amazing if we could get anaerobic digesters for goose waste, and then we would be solving problems across the organization. So that's where I'm going to put my money. Yeah, and I would just add to a lot of the discussion about. Um, 
climate goals and how we can address our climate goals. That's one of the areas too, I just wanted to highlight for the benefit of city council, our integration with other departments, such as our climate initiative staff, our facilities team that Sam, I think you mentioned. So um, we didn't dive deep into that this evening, um, but that is one of the areas that is an overarching lens of our whole plan. And when we come back to council later this year, um, that's probably one of the areas we will be having a, a lot more uh, discussion and information uh, but certainly these are great ideas and uh, we're working across the, the organization too to understand what opportunities might exist to solve some of those issues. It wouldn't be a study session without reference to poop. Let's move, <laughs> let's move on to um, our sixth and final question and then wrap it up by the bottom of the hour. Perfect, thank you. So for our sixth question, we have a twofer with regards to uh, who is served in equity. How should BPR consider serving those who do not live in the city of Boulder? And how should BPR ensure increasing fees do not create additional financial barriers? Toughest questions for last. Ideas on this one, folks. I'll just chime in. Woven into one of the last questions, we heard, I, I feel like you all have addressed 6A. And so unless someone has something to add to that, I think we could focus on 6B, which again, you all have already started talking about. To soften the ground, I'll mention our equity program, right? So this is a program funded through health equity fund dollars that right now is providing 100% free access to anyone who qualifies. Something we'd love to figure out is a sliding scale program, right? We, there, we know there's a cliff effect when it comes to social services. I would suggest that same thing happens with our services where you make just over those numbers and you don't qualify for support for our programs, but it still might be out of reach. And how hard would it be to, to implement a program like that, Ali, where there's a sliding scale? Um, if someone will write a check, we will figure it out, Bob, right? So it's it's all about how do you pay for it? So I think implementing it wouldn't be complicated. We have the mechanisms now to do the means testing, and it would just be about establishing tiers or metrics. And I have confidence that our partners in housing and human services, they're, they're so talented at that type of work. It, it would be how do you pay for it? Because we, we still would have costs for serving those folks. Great. Thanks, Sally. Mary. Thanks, Bob. I think um, the the Requity Pass is really great. I'm just my question is, um, how difficult is the application process, and and is it possible to streamline it more? Because I think that's that that can be a barrier. You may qualify, but it 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 can be cumbersome um, to apply. Let me say this: we have gone fully online since the pandemic for that application process. And since 2014, we've reduced, I think the page count for the process in half. We've worked with many of our partners such as Boulder Housing Partners to have one door. So if you qualify for Boulder Housing Partners assistance, you qualify with us. Um, the, um, the program developed in partnership with the Google Fellows that directs people to services and the name is a skip, Boulder for me, right? That program directs people. Mary, what I think our best next step for financial aid is to actually talk to some of our community members that are participants in the program and find out, did they find it cumbersome? Where was it complicated? Where was it tricky? And continue to, to, to improve the user experience based mm -hmm. on their feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we've had capacity for that in the last year and a half, but that would be a great next step. Thank you, Allie. Thanks, Mary. Um, if there's no other uh, reaction to this question, uh, perhaps we could ask the parks team to um, wrap things up, bring, bring us up to speed and, and talk a little bit about uh, next steps. Hello again, everyone. So I'll just quickly um, just mention that um, the last three um, key themes, which were determined in 2014, are still important to community members. And we didn't see um, any critical areas of misalignment and BPR is continuing to address these. So just to briefly touch on um, teens and youth, um, the community members feel that these are important groups. The graph, I mean, a majority 87 and 86% feel it's important to provide programming for these groups. Um, and specifically for teens, um, there were there are increasing concerns about their physical and mental health, especially when considering increasing rates of depression and anxiety and challenges related to COVID. 
um, among this age group, and that's a trend we're seeing throughout the country. Um, so community members expressed an interest in looking at focusing programming more towards their specific needs. Um, and for youth, um, BPR um, had a nature symposium, nature play symposium in 2015, and kids are still very interested in that and um, are excited about the possibilities it offers um, in terms of unplugging and just getting out there and getting wild. Um, so BPR um, plays a major role, you know, engaging youth, building social connections, helping them get exercise, and recognizing the value of environmental stewardship um, serves them throughout their lives. And BPR is critical to that. So, um, and then for building community and partnerships, um, BPR has been doing this successfully. We talked about some of that, Ali mentioned some of that. Um, that being said, as the population grows and changes um, and resources are stretched, the department will need to think creatively about funding, which we already talked about. Um, but a majority of respondents to the statistically valid survey um, feel that it's important to partner with public entities and private organizations. And they also think that um, continuing and improving existing partnerships and establishing new relationships are key to supporting equity and inclusion. Um, and um, they specifically ensuring more new and different voices are heard, um, expanding those partnerships. I think Mary touched on that in terms of like smaller businesses and entrepreneurship things like that, um, and also establishing a resilient community network. Um, so BPR can successfully address social pub public health and economic concerns and challenges and environmental challenges in the future. Um, and that will just help Boulder be more resilient. Um, so, and with that, Regina is gonna quickly talk to you about organizational readiness. Thank you, Sarah. So again, continuing to, just to talk quickly about organizational readiness, continuing to support a talented and modern workforce is critical to ensuring the demands being placed on the department continue to be met for the community. Um, business management practices that leverage the use of new technology, data-driven decision-making, and collaborative decision-making tools are important for the department to respond in meaningful ways to changes occurring within both the industry and our community. Due to COVID-19 in uh, 2020, the department laid off 10 full-time staff, while an additional five employees retired. Overall, this represented a loss of 200 years of service to the department and institutional knowledge. And in the coming years, our challenge will be to build back that capacity loss to meet the needs and expectation of the Boulder community. A period of staff engagement just wrapped up yesterday, asking staff to weigh in on how the department has been supporting them prior to the pandemic and what areas need, to, need some focus in the future. And these staff engagement results will help us shape the strategies and initiatives developed in the next phase of the master plan update related to organizational readiness. And so with that, we've really come to the end of our discussion this evening. Um, and moving forward, the project team will be working to incorporate your feedback as well as the PRABs into the, our final needs assessment deliverables. And then we'll be, as I mentioned earlier, moving into the implementation plan phase of the project. And during this phase, we'll be identifying the specific strategies and initiatives the department will focus on for the next five to seven years, as well as the metrics we'll use to measure our success. There will be a third window of community engagement that will help us prioritize which strategies and initiatives um, should be conceived, should be pursued, excuse me. And that next window of community engagement will really be a key to our future success. And we're working now to develop the strategies to ensure that our outreach is resulting in broad community input on those implementation initiatives to pursue. And as I'm, again, as I mentioned earlier, we will be coming back to council both later this year um, or early next year with our recommendations and a draft plan for your review and input. And with that, we have come to our time, end of time this evening, and thank you for your time. Well, great. Well, thanks so much to the, to the park staff and their advisors. Um, Ali, did you and your team get everything you needed tonight? I think we did. I appreciate council being concise and pointed in your comments that this really will help the next phase. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again uh, as we develop our implementation plan. Great. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I think you guys are excused for the evening. We're going to turn our attention now to the East Boulder uh, master plan, East Boulder sub community plan, I should say. Um, we've got a team of people from both the planning department and the uh, transportation department uh, ready to present 
uh, their 60% plan um, with the goal of bringing back about a 90% plan towards the end of the year. And so they want to check base with us. They have a, a lot of slides. I'm just going to go through very, very quickly. Um, and then I, I'd like to suggest to allow them to, to keep their flow going on the slides. We let them get through their slides quickly and then kind of save our questions uh, for staff to the end. And then they have about three or four questions back for us. And so if, uh, if there's no objection, why don't we, uh, why don't we handle it that way and turn it over to Nuria to introduce the, uh, the staff that will be presenting this um, the subcommunity plan draft. Sure. And, and again, thanks for all your great input uh, for parks and parks for such a great presentation. For now, I'll turn it over to Jacob if he wants to frame it. And if not, we'll head straight to Kathleen. Great. Uh, thank you, Nuria. And good evening, uh, Councilmember Yates, Mayor Weaver, members of Council. Um, this discussion tonight is really a milestone in a two-year-long effort to create the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan. And I'd like to thank you all in advance for your input tonight um, as we're getting very close to a final draft. And I'd also like to give thanks to the many, many community members who have given input into this plan, and especially to the members of the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan Working Group for their ongoing contributions that have shaped the work that you'll see this evening. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the project manager for this plan, Kathleen King. Thanks so much. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, as mentioned, my name is Kathleen King. I'm a senior planner in comprehensive planning, and I'll be joined by my colleague, Jean Sanson from Transportation. Um, we also have some guests joining us from our consultant team on the 55th and Arapahoe station area plan. So Jay Renkins and Mark De La Torre from MIG and Rachel Shinman from EPS. Um, I think tonight marks our, our seventh meeting with council on this project. So we're excited to share the latest project progress on the, on the subcommunity plan and hear your feedback. Um, Taylor, I'll just give you a, a nod um, or say next for um, advancing slides. So go ahead and move to the next slide. So we're gonna uh, present some key features of the 60% draft plan, and then we'll dive into greater detail with MIG at 55th and Arapahoe and wrap up our presentation talking about next steps for engagement. Um, as Bob mentioned, we'll have time for any clarifying questions and then really hope to hear back from you about the key questions we've outlined. Next, please. To give you an idea of where we are in the schedule, we've completed the first four phases of work and are now going back out to the community to confirm that major recommendations are in line with community vision and start planning for implementation. We'll spend some time analyzing community feedback and making updates to the draft subcommunity plan and then be back at boards for recommendations towards the end of this year and looking for council adoption in early 2022. This council has provided amazing guidance and feedback throughout the process on this project and has helped keep momentum through the challenges of COVID so, um, you know, tonight we'd love to get your thoughts on the major components of the plan and hope you can provide the next council with guidance on the plan's adoption. Next, please. So here's the, the key questions for tonight. We'll be going through each of these components of the draft plan and then also want to know um, what input we can solicit from community members in order to update the draft in a way that's most in line with community vision. Next, please. So um, we'll get into it. Uh, the 60% draft includes, um, as I mentioned, these major components of the plan. And then an upcoming engagement window this fall will offer community members the greatest opportunity to weigh in on changes included in the plan and help prioritize strategies for implementation. So that's why we call it the community review draft. Next. Key features include the vision for the subcommunity, a land use plan, and a connections plan, both deliverables that will guide future development, inform future work on zoning updates and capital investments. Next. As a, a quick recap of how we arrived at this milestone, there's been a great amount of participation in the project from the community and the major components I just described represent what we've heard from community members as their priorities and desires for the evolution of the East Boulder into the future. Next, please. Our last major engagement window included the presentation of various land use scenarios, including a no change option to community members and collecting input about trade-offs and impacts. 
The feedback we received during this engagement window has guided much of the working group and staff team's iteration of the land use and connections plans. Next. We heard from the community that there is a desire to balance areas of no change with making a few targeted changes from office or industrial uses to mixed use neighborhoods. When asked about preferences for changing land uses in East Boulder, almost 40% of respondents would prefer to um, convert a few areas from office or industrial to mixed use, and that's that purple bar. Around 20% preferred no land use changes from current plan to result in um, limited new housing, and 18% um, wanted to maximize where mixed use could be allowed to encourage and fill the blue, um, that's that blue bar. Next, please. So that input really guides the vision for East Boulder. Over the past two years, we've learned a lot about the people and places that make up the East Boulder subcommunity. It's a great business center hosting a um, wide variety of um, small to large businesses. It has a small but significant residential community at San Lazaro, and there are a great number of natural and, and recreational assets that have the potential to play a more significant role in the future of this place. Next. Our mission in subcommunity planning is to evaluate each subcommunity and find ways to implement these six focus areas of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan into the area. For East Boulder, we think we've landed in a great place that balances trade-offs while still making important contributions to citywide goals. Next. So the vision for East Boulder is to evolve in a way that the subcommunity will thrive as an innovative working industrial subcommunity of Boulder where all community members have access and options for living, working, and playing. This is really, you know, it's not a small idea. The vision describes a place that maintains its industrial nature, but welcomes new, new uses, the most significant being residential. We believe that with the community's input, we have a draft plan that is designed to be strategic about change, but flexible enough to take advantage of opportunities if they arise. Next. So that vision is um, partially implemented through the land use plan. The land use plan uh, includes changes to existing land use, and those are areas um, those areas are outlined in yellow, redefining what some of those land uses mean, adding a new land use designation, and pursuing the annexation of important areas such as the San Lazaro Mobile Home Community to help create more cohesive neighborhoods. We reviewed a, a version of this when we met back in April and council gave great feedback that helped us make some key updates like extending the reach of a mixed use in the industrial land use to the 55th street corridor and reserving land adjacent to KOA Lake for community industrial uses. Next please. So how do these changes compare to what is currently planned in the BVCP? Um, this graphic compares the amount of land designated to each kind of land use in the BVCP land use map, those are in blue, um, to the recommended land uses, which are in orange. So you can see that the most obvious shift is in the redesignation of light industrial land to mixed use designation. So we'll take a look at those. Next, please. The BVCP land use map includes a designation called mixed use industrial. However, the, the definition of this designation is relatively vague and it leaves considerations about key characteristics to other guiding tools. So using community feedback, we've received about how mixed use industrial neighborhoods should look and perform in Boulder. We're including a revised definition for this land use in the draft subcommunity plan. Next. We're also adding a new land use designation that will help guide redevelopment in the 55th and Arapahoe station area. This recommendation is also meant to provide guidance for other areas of the city into the future as we continue to plan for transit oriented neighborhoods and shifting travel behaviors across the city. Next, please. The plan also includes some other tools that will help provide greater detail and guidance to future work in the area. Next. One such tool is what we call place types. So this place types diagram for the areas of change in East Boulder in combination with the place types descriptions and performance standards provide a greater level of detail about the design quality and placemaking expectations for East Boulder. Next. 
Each place type combines expectations about uses, building heights and densities with transportation oriented features like access and mobility. This tool will guide future implementation work, including potential code updates, rezonings, and the potential creation of new zones or considerations for form-based code in the subcommunity. Next, please. The draft plan also includes a vision for integrating new residential opportunities into East Boulder. Next. Based on the land uses and place types the team generated, we could expect East Boulder to contribute between 2,600 and 4,400 new homes to the city's housing stock. That range is entirely dependent on private redevelopment. Using the 25% requirement of new residential development allocated for affordable housing, this could contribute between 580 and 1,100 new permanently affordable units. Next, please. So you'll remember last fall, um, we presented three different land use scenarios to council and the community for evaluation and feedback. Comparing this draft plan with those scenarios, I think we've landed at a, a pretty healthy balance between the options. Um, a major reason for this is our strategic approach to identifying key neighborhoods where residential density could be well integrated into some of these business oriented places and also help to create 15 minute neighborhoods. Next. Um, and that, you know, that 15 minute neighborhood strategy is a key component to our efforts for supporting local businesses in East Boulder. Being able to build a great network of business, workforce, and customers in East Boulder will help the area thrive and businesses grow. Next, please. Additionally, the land use plan does maintain a significant amount, a significant amount of land that will be prioritized for industrial use. We made no changes to general industrial land in East Boulder, so we will still have a place for those heavier manufacturing sites and businesses in the subcommunity. We slightly increased the amount of community industrial land in the subcommunity by identifying key areas where small businesses and small business space can operate freely but still have great access for transporting goods. While the land use recommendations do change other areas of the subcommunity from light industrial use to a mixed use industrial category, the intention is to bring greater access and allow for more density in these areas so that we can integrate residential into industrial neighborhoods in a way that supports a solid network of residents, businesses, and workforce. So they all experience success together. Next, please. So supporting that network of businesses and new residents includes some major recommendations contributing to our access and mobility goals. I'm going to turn it over to Jean Sanson from Transportation to talk through those recommendations. Thank you, Kathleen, and good evening, City Council. If we could go to the next slide. So the connections plan included in the 60% draft has three major components, what we call the big moves, some new connections in key areas of change that I'll review with you, and enhancements to our existing network that we have proposed in the next update to the transportation master plan. These recommendations help to support the vision that Kathleen described and the land use plan while also responding to the many community comments we've received about transportation needs and upgrades in the area. Next, please. So first I'm gonna start with the big moves. You know, the 2040 vision for East Arapahoe transforms one of our city's busiest travel corridors into a complete street with better travel options, both for the commuters that are there today and for the greater number of people who will be working and living in East Boulder into the future. And a cornerstone of this transportation improvement will be the high frequency, high quality regional bus rapid transit that's been referenced that will serve Arapahoe, which is State Highway 7, connecting Boulder to communities to the east as far as I-25 and Brighton. The next big move involves the hop. So the hop service will be expanded into the East Boulder area. In the future, residents, employees, and visitors can conveniently travel via hop between East Boulder and destinations throughout the rest of the city. This may take the form of fixed route transit or a micro transit concept whereby buses run on a more of an on-demand flexible schedule throughout East Boulder. So transportation staff will be closely monitoring travel patterns as we come out of the pandemic to best meet the needs of the area and provide this high, high frequency transit service into this part of our community. The next big idea includes in integrating micromobility options throughout East Boulder. And I think this is familiar with many of you. 
One of the biggest challenges travelers have when deciding whether to take the bus or use other forms of transportation is how to get to their destination or how to get from their destination when things feel a little too far. So for example, when deciding how to travel between destinations in East Boulder, like between the Flatiron Business Park and Ozo Coffee, the distance can feel too far to walk. So as you all know, later this year, we'll be um, contracting with shared e-bike and e-scooter vendors to provide community members with these shared devices that will be easily accessible and affordable and are expected to be deployed throughout the East Boulder sub-community. The next big move relates to curbside management. We as a city are looking at curbside management strategies and programs to manage this new combination of industrial office and residential uses throughout the city and specifically East Boulder. As a hub for industrial and commercial facilities, a large number of goods and freight vehicles move through and load and unload in the East Boulder subcommunity each day and we expect to do so into the future. In addition to ensuring freight and good vehicles can continue to safely navigate the roadway network, it will also be important for the city to address the growing competition for curbside space and ensure that it's adequately managed to support changing land uses. And finally, the fifth big move includes a regional mobility hub and satellite hubs at the 55th and Arapahoe bus rapid transit station area. One of the keys to attracting people to transit and other modes of transportation is creating places where a variety of transportation options are centrally located. And our consultant team will dive more into this concept in the next part of this presentation. Next, please. But before we get to that, we'll look at some of the new connections that are included in the draft plan. So these new connections are intended to support planned land uses by improving access into and out of areas of change, expanding the pedestrian and bicycle network in the subcommunity and creating opportunities for street activation and vibrancy in these evolving neighborhoods. This diagram shows how the proposed connections are integrated into the existing network, both existing and planned of roads and bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And with that, I will turn this back over to Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks. So, um... You know, how do all of these pieces come together and what could this evolution of East Boulder neighborhoods really look like? Next, please. I'm gonna uh, attempt to demonstrate this for the area of change um, we're lovingly calling the Park West neighborhood, which is located on the west side of Valmont City Park. Next, please. So this is the Park West neighborhood as it is today. This is a, a bird's eye image bird's eye image from Google Earth. Um, so you see the, the Goose Creek Greenway on the, um, that's the south side of the site. Um, and then we're bound by Pearl Street, Foothills Parkway, Belmont Road, and then Belmont City Park. Next, please. Um, so this is that same area with the, the place types diagram applied. So the light green on, on this diagram is that Parkside residential. The um, purple is the Main Street industrial. That reddish color is the hands-on industrial. And then that orange color is the um, trail-oriented live work place type. Next, please. So this would be that Parkside residential opportunity. We're standing um, just south of Valmont Road in the park, and you can see how these townhome units front onto the park and these new residential homes would have this great access and connection to park space. So working group members have identified these areas as having great potential for creating that missing middle format of housing. Next, please. As you make your way south, we're now standing at Sterling Drive. And this incorporates our ideas about upgrades to this street, as well as the potential for redevelopment and a key connection between the neighborhood and a more eventful entry into and out of the park than what's there today. Next. So now we've actually walked um, all the way beyond the south end of the park and you can start to see some of that trail oriented live work um, place type along Goose Creek Greenway, integrating residential opportunities with existing light industrial and taking advantage of the different formats of, of access for pedestrians and cyclists. Next, please. Today, the, the Goose Creek Greenway includes some flood control facilities and a multi-use path. It has um, some great views to the west, but it's not a particularly um, attractive 
uh, stretch of the Greenway and it doesn't offer a ton in the way of amenities. So the vision for this area is to make that a real centerpiece of the neighborhood where businesses and residents on either side could really enjoy the green space in this industrial area. And then this image also shows some of the um, recommended street upgrades to Pearl Street. Next, please. This image takes a, a closer look at how we're thinking about live work buildings of a more industrial nature in this area and repurposing space that today is, um, you know, kind of a really, really long driveway for more of a boardwalk where some of these light industrial businesses could actually start to incorporate a retail component. Next, please. Um, another bird's eye view demonstrating upgrades to Pearl Street. Um, those live work buildings and how we're hoping to build in great active public spaces as part of redevelopment to create those third places in the neighborhood that generate um, great activity and help create local destinations for community members. Next, please. And so, you know, this plan is, is really about evolving these neighborhoods and um, evolution is a process that builds off strengths and little by little over time becomes something greater. Next, please. The draft plan includes a variety of recommendations to give the East Boulder subcommunity greater opportunities for achieving citywide goals and contributing to positive change as Boulder evolves into the future. Next, please. I'm going to turn it over now to um, Jay and Mark from MIG, who will take us to another area of change, the 55th and Arapaho Station area. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna try and summarize, you know, a year, a year plus worth of work into a very short kind of piece here, just to make sure we're respecting y'all's time. The section that we'll be speaking to here in the next few minutes is at a very, very high level, going to touch on the existing conditions, kind of technical analysis and community engagement for the stamp specifically as part of the larger sub-community plan. And then we're really gonna focus the meat of the conversation and presentation from our perspective on land use and mobility. We'll go ahead and wrap up with urban design to kind of talk to the character and feel to those spaces. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, starting with existing conditions, next slide please, and engagement. Next slide, oh, thank you. <laughs> so the uh, 55th and Arapahoe stationary master plan, as you all recall from the prior day, and that Kathleen had up on the screen there, is a smaller 60 acre chunk of the larger sub-community area on the south end there, focused really around uh, Arapahoe Avenue and 55th Street as the name of the station area suggests. Next slide please. Through the technical analysis and through some of the initial engagement at a very high level, some of those takeaways as it relates to land use and transportation really focused on leveraging the transit investment. And some of that came through the creation of the mix of uses, through a, a better utilization of land use and zoning policies, and then really thinking about the, the larger connectivity, increasing that for pedestrian and bicycle, and then thinking about how better to augment potential redevelopment with supporting mobility hubs. Last piece of note that's really important as part of that takeaway is the you know, concerns of gentrification. You know, not all change is good. So the management of that change with the provision of new amenities is certainly part of, as we dove into the a greater level of detail, mix of land uses, the types of connectivity that was appropriate, how we would best satisfy that moving forward. Next slide, please. From the market standpoint, uh, as y'all well know, there is a demand for a lot of different uses, especially in this area between office, multifamily, retail, industrial flex. Uh, the biggest thing that we're seeing though from a reason as to why it isn't changing today is that there's no real incentive for redevelopment. A lot of the existing returns for the facilities and uses throughout the site are fine as is. So there's not really gonna be an effective change um, from a, a larger site standpoint without some sort of either greater entitlement or uh, consideration to how best to provide new amenities or new elements for the community that might be tied to new development. Obviously, this is all kind of couched within this kind of larger opportunity for growth and change to better respond to the evolving needs of Boulder. Next slide, please. And uh, I, like, I'm not going to try to read most of the stuff on the slide. Suffice to say, we engaged in a rather robust engagement process that ran parallel to the sub-community planning process and built off of that. So uh, doubling up where we could and digging into detail with other subgroups throughout that process with a, a subcommittee from the working group, various community meetings, focus groups, and parallel engagement on Be Heard Boulder. Next slide, please. 
it's hard to still the last kind of rambling down into a single slide. All that really resulted in the guiding principles, which helped guide how we engaged uh, the community, how we asked questions, what questions we asked, and how we thought about conceptualizing different concepts and conceptual recommendations for uh, land use, for redevelopment, for connectivity and at a larger level. And that begins with prioritizing transit supportive strategies from prior adopted plans and into the evolution of both this plan and the larger sub community plan. Uh, some of that we're thinking about incremental change that um, just because we say a new land use uh, is fine doesn't mean that that's going to change overnight or perhaps ever. You know, these are it's privately owned property. It's up to the owner's discretion there. But thinking about how best to achieve change over time was an important part of that process. And that was achieved through ensuring that flexibility, both in the development framework as well as in means of achieving different goals from the focus areas established as part of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. With that said, I'm going to say next slide, hand it over to Jay, and I'll talk to you all with you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> so as Mark said, we're going to touch on land use first, and then two other additional topics quickly. Uh, so next slide. Um, as part of that robust engagement process that Mark spoke to in working with Kathleen and Jean uh, and others at the city, uh, we did a, a large engagement window in the spring where we actually presented different alternatives uh, to the community as well as our working group um, and a committee focused just on the stamp area. Um, next slide. Uh, coming out of that discussion, uh, we landed on a preferred uh, concept, as we call it. Um, in this preferred concept, uh, what you're seeing in the colored um, polygons, uh, kind of the bubbles, are a variety of place types, uh, which correspond to the place types for the larger sub-community area. Um, so those I'll go over in a second here, um, what those entail. Um, but it's a combination of mixed use, um, uh, aligning with the TOD mixed use or mixed use TOD land use designation being recommended in the larger sub-community plan. And then thinking about the different amenities, particularly on the transportation side, um, that will be necessary to support those new uses in the area. So right now there's certain portions of this uh, stamp area, although it, it's not a uh, especially large area, uh, but that are relatively disconnected. Um, you know, it's difficult to get from point A to point B if you're not in a car and, you know, maybe driving several blocks around. Um, we're also showing on here with the purple asterisks, uh, mobility hubs, similar to what Jean uh, Sanson was mentioning. Um, so having um, a presence, obviously, at the station itself at 55th and Arapaho, but then a distributed strategy. And then thinking long term about the future RTD mobility hub uh, that co could come um, along the rail line as well uh, with regional connectivity. Next slide. So the different uses, and we'll show you, once we introduce you to those, these, we will uh, show you where these uh, land again on that concept diagram, but flex in essence is office and industrial, um, similar to what's in the Flatirons Business Park today and portions of the stamp area. A flex mixed use, uh, which would allow those same uh, light industrial and office, with, but with some retail and supporting services. Um, that could both serve those local employees as well as neighbors nearby or new residents in the area. A residential mixed use uh, designation, uh, which is predominantly residential, but with ground floor retail and personal services, again, serving both new residents as well as nearby existing residents. And finally, probably the most different from what uh, we've heard so far this evening is innovation mixed use. And it does, it's sort of a play on the light industrial mixed use, but with a, a, an intent of uh, developing a residential and office above ground floor, light industrial maker space and retail space. Next slide. So when we think about those different designations, the residential mixed use is really uh, along Arapaho for the most part and at the stationary at 55th and Arapaho. Innovation mixed use, which is the last designation I just spoke about, um, is to the north, uh, transitioning to the uh, mixed use industrial designation uh, up at the Flatirons Business Park. And then as we head west towards Ball and the, the medical campus, uh, transitioning to flex and flex mixed use, with the flex mixed use being along the Arapaho corridor. Next slide. So this is illustrative. I just want to make that very clear. Um, you know, one thing that I sure for sure I think is that you know 
when if we did an aerial photograph in 20 years, which is the planning horizon that we're talking about, it will not look just like this, but this is a way to explore different intent. Um, think about setbacks, setbacks, um, open space in relationships, as well as uh, the connectivity that we're trying to create. So uh, generally, we're looking at uh, structured parking long term versus surface parking today. We're looking at uh, a relatively intact grid network, building on what's there today, but making some important key connections. Um, and then uh, I think the, what was probably most different from looking at the existing condition is the green. Um, thinking about landscaping, thinking about setbacks where we can have these landscape kind of public spaces, uh, trees throughout the area, which are really lacking today, um, which will help with the heat island effect, help with aesthetics and help with placemaking. Next slide. We started to think about how is this realized? And, and again, this is even more of a shot in the dark in terms of which building does what, but we think there's four categories in essence of how redevelopment could occur or, or this vision is realized, I should say. So one is that nothing changes. Um, you know, this vision actually works if you know, a certain percentage of these existing properties don't redevelop. Second, we think that there's an opportunity for people to invest in the existing buildings. That could be for adaptive reuse or expansion. Third would be uh, looking at potential infill opportunities, um, maybe on some of the surface parking lots. And last would be actual redevelopment where you're taking down an existing building and putting up a, a new structure, a series of structures. So we're depicting uh, sort of a proportion of all of those here, but again, they could happen all different ways in all different places. Next slide. Here we're being a little more directive in terms of thinking about the heights across the site. Mark mentioned the entitlements um, that might be necessary to help motivate um, or uh, facilitate uh, the uh, realization of the vision. So we're in essence showing with the darkest blue here or even purple, you might call it five-story development uh, within that 55 foot height limit, uh, but really kind of maxing that out um, again at the station along 55th. Um, then looking at some four story structures, particularly as we uh, sort of emanate out from uh, the station, particularly as we head north, but you can see a handful uh, distributed throughout and then stepping down to three or fewer stories uh, as we head west and south in particular. Next slide. So really quickly, I wanted to elaborate on the mobility and circulation uh, concepts. Next slide. We have a series of goals around mobility and circulation. Um, I don't have to read all of these, um, but in essence, the idea is to connect people to uh, the amenities, including transit, of course. So we want to think about the transit amenities. How do we get people there? And how do we get people not just in the stamp area to this area, but the neighborhood to the area and people who are maybe working or living in this area um, outside of the area? Next slide. So a key piece of that is thinking about that street network. We talked about instituting more of a grid which would may be made up of a hierarchy of streets and a variety of bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, an important new connection that really helps to establish that more intact grid would be an extension of Conestoga Court. We may not call it a court in the future since it would be more connected, um, but heading east and west, um, about one block north of Arapahoe Avenue. That then provides connectivity across 55th. Uh, we want to enhance those crossings of 55th and where they currently exist um, with a new connection across uh, at Western uh, crossing 55th, but also along Arapaho. Um, even crossing at uh, Ozo Coffee, thinking about the 55th and Arapaho intersection, not really great places across, feels uncomfortable. Um, and so we want to make sure that people do have that choice, whether they're driving to the area, taking transit, walking or biking here, that once they're here, they can walk, bike, take an e-scooter, an e-bike, like Jean was talking about, really comfortably and very safely. Next slide. So all those different lines on the map correspond to different types of streets that we're looking at. Um, so one uh, that we're talking about, as I mentioned, was Conestoga Court or that extension. So an activation street, we really think that this could be a signature element of the area, but we don't want to disregard the other streets. So next slide. So we've introduced a series of different streets that do have amenities, um, have buffered sidewalks to really create safe places for people to walk and traverse, um, shared bike lanes in this particular instance with landscaping. Next slide. 
Um, we're looking also at a multi-use path configuration that we think would be work really well in certain instances. Next slide. There's also neighborhood streets um, and so or residential streets, excuse me, which would be sort of smaller local streets, but again with nice amenities um, adding to the tree lawn condition. I mean, think really thinking about that interface of the building uh, fronts with the streets themselves. Next slide. The last uh, street type that I'll highlight is just the pedestrian bicycle emergency access street. Uh, I don't think anyone would use that terminology, but the important piece here is that we can look for opportunities to create uh, connections for bicycles and pedestrians without always introducing cars. Uh, in particular, neighbors to the south uh, indicated that they would really like a way to travel east and west, um, south of Arapahoe without being on Arapahoe itself. Um, so this is one opportunity to do something like that. So it could provide access for service vehicles, emergency vehicles, so on and so forth. Uh, we could look for other opportunities, particularly as we head east towards the planned trail alignment along the drainage there. On the last couple of slides of mobility, I'll turn it back to Mark. Um, uh, Jean mentioned mobility hubs. Um, in addition to the e-bikes, e-scooters, um, connections to transit, we want to be thinking about car share, we want to be thinking about the shelters and amenities, parking for bikes, for uh, vehicles, how do we manage that um, using transportation demand management strategies, uh, how do we provide retail opportunities. Next slide. While we don't know the exact shape and, you know, and location of all the different types of development, we can use um, sort of this typology on the left, thinking about uh, where the BRT station is, thinking about if a district parking garage, thinking about residential and then these other uses and the types of mobility hub features that would be distributed throughout. So rather than one large complex, which I think there was a misconception in the spring that we were talking about, you know, some big parking structure and all the all of these different amenities kind of being loaded in in this one location, the idea is to really distribute these uh, different amenities throughout. So the mobility becomes really seamless and uh, interrelated throughout all of the development. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark to hit urban design quickly. Thanks, Jay. And just to wrap up here, knowing that as we, uh, next slide, engage, have engaged the community, continue to engage the community, the conversations around land use and redevelopment can feel a bit foreign sometimes. So we wanted to make sure that we thought about the experience for the user itself. Next slide, please. So here looking to the north at the intersection of 55th and Arapo taking those hypothetical development blocks, taking those hypothetical um, you know, layout and then building into the, the more detailed stories and setback considerations, we wanna to start to think about the environments that those create and how those can help augment or really increase the quality of the experience in the area. Next slide, please. More further down 55th, thinking about you know, further north-south connectivity. Some of our conditions today uh, within the existing curb to curb do accommodate you know, multimodal traffic. We think about bikes, bikes, pads, but sometimes as, as y'all can see, it's not the, the nicest of conditions perhaps, or the safest for that matter. Next slide, please. So when we think about redevelopment on our edges, we wanna think about better ways of accommodating the uh, slower speed mobility along with that redevelopment. So redevelopment really tying into the increased quality for the experience for all user groups. Next slide, please. And then when we think about the types of development that Jay had noted, you know, we, we don't achieve this through just redeveloping everything, scraping it, putting it back up. It, it's it's things staying in place. It's it's parking lots and filling. Next slide, please. And when we think about the industrial kind of flavor and character of the area, it's keeping some of those existing building existing building stock that contributes to that that kind of the the flavor of this area or the the boulder mystique as we as we heard numerous times throughout our engagement process and finding ways to insert development that's appropriate and allows for the creation of new publicly oriented spaces and with that that wraps up the 55th and around portion kathleen thank you thanks mark um we just have one more section of the presentation thanks for your patience i will try to get through this material quickly um next slide please we're planning on another major engagement window this fall to share the community review draft and collect input from the broader public. Um, next. Over the past year, we found that virtual engagement has been a great way to expand our access to community members and has allowed for greater participation in long range planning projects um, among other city engagement efforts. Community members have really built their capacity and have come to expect the ability to weigh in on their own time and terms. So we're building on that to offer um, a variety of online on-demand learning and feedback tools. 
We will focus the in-person engagement on helping those who don't engage as well in a virtual environment um, and where that interaction or exchange of information will be better facilitated in person. So that will include um, two meetings with East Boulder property owners to facilitate discussion about concerns or questions um, surrounding recommended changes to or near their properties. Um, we also are planning for a meeting with the San Lazaro um, residents that will be designed um, with the help of our community connectors, and then a series of, of office hours in East Boulder for um, those who may want to talk in person rather than, than engage in that online participation. Next, please. We'll be asking the community to confirm that the major components of the plan are on the right track and that the draft offers recommendations that balance our citywide goals in a way that's context appropriate to East Boulder. Um, next, please. So far, we've gotten some more specific input from working group members about the types of feedback that would help them move forward, including asking questions about housing. Um, does the plan make a contribution to citywide housing goals that's appropriate for the area? Um, industrial land and local business. Does the plan balance the interest in new housing for the area with needs of local businesses? And then um, implementation, what recommendations included in the plan should be prioritized for near mid and long-term implementation? Next, please. So um, just, just recently on July 15th, Planning Board and Transportation Advisory Board held a joint board's work session to review the draft. And in general, the group um, expressed general support for the connections plan and much of the, the 55th and Arapahoe station area concept, but wanted some more data and discussion around impacts to the city's industrial land, um, jobs to housing ratio, residential project product types, and um, impacts to climate. So I just, I have some of that data to share now. Um, next. For questions around industrial land, um, we took a, a look at trends over the last 10 years related to the city's inventory of industrial land. Since board members expressed concern about a, a perceived loss of industrial space in the city, um, we found there's, there's actually been a slight increase in the amount of land that is designated for industrial uses. Um, over the last 10 years, the most significant being in our IG zones, um, we've seen a small amount of IM and IMS zoned zoned land that has changed to other uses in that same period of time. But overall, um, there is more designated industrial land in Boulder as a whole than there was 10 years ago. Next, please. Related to housing, um, boards members wanted more detail about the types of housing products that might be built in East Boulder and how we could regulate for these in the subcommunity plan. The land use plan and the place types tool will provide really important guidance about expectations for residential housing types, but the plan will not include specific zoning recommendations. Subcommunity plans are really intended to set a clear vision for the future of a defined area. And then, you know, any code changes, rezoning, or application of form-based code to regulate specific product type would be a future PNDS work plan item and considered part of the plan's implementation work following adoption. Um, next, please. Thanks. And then um, there was also interest from boards about how the plan will contribute to climate impacts. So there's a variety of policy program and project recommendations that staff and working group members will be evaluating to incorporate in our resilience and climate commitment recommendations. But we believe one of the most impactful aspects of the plan will be how the changes in land use and transportation recommendations impact the number of single occupant vehicle trips into and out of the subcommunity. Um, by offering options for those who work in the subcommunity to actually live in the area, um, by creating 15 minute neighborhoods and increasing access to high frequency transit and offering new modes for first and last mile connections. Next please. So um, we just wanted to make sure we address those topics and concerns before diving into the questions. But that is uh, it for our presentation. Thank you for um, your, your attention and your patience. Um, staff and the consultant team are available to answer any clarifying questions, and then we'd love to get your feedback on these four key questions. Well, great. Thanks so much, Kathleen and team, for that. Uh, uh, 83 slides in 43 minutes. Uh, that's going to be a new record, so thank you for being uh, uh, 
uh, presenting a lot of information. I know that, uh, the, that the community team that you've been working with has um, provided you with a lot of guidance, probably some of it not entirely internally consistent. And so thank you for for uh, walking those lines and presenting faithfully what you heard from community members, but also your your own recommendations. So we really, really appreciate um, you giving us a lot of information in a short period of time. This, of course, is not our first touch on this. This is not gonna be our last touch on this. This is the 60% plan. Um, you're looking for some feedback tonight. You'll come back in a few months with the 90% plan. You'll take some more feedback from us. So uh, we look at this as a very iterative process. Um, let's do this, uh, council colleagues. Let's um, first, um, uh, ask questions of um, of the staff and, the, and, the, and their advisors and get all those questions exhausted first. We've still got another uh, 45 minutes allocated to this and we don't have to take the whole 45, but let's uh, let's take the next few minutes and pose questions, make sure that we're clear on everything that's been presented very, very quickly. And then we'll um, go through uh, maybe council member by council member and ask, uh, answer the full questions. So we have a hands up for questions from Aaron, then Sam, then Mary, then Mark, then Rachel. Aaron, you're up. Great, well, thank you for the uh, very thorough presentation and a lot of great ideas. There's clearly been a huge amount of work put into this and uh, it's really exciting to see this starting to come to fruition. So appreciate all that you all have been working on. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, the place types, I thought that there was an intriguing idea there, you know, something that's sitting kind of in between land uses and zoning with some additional kind of guidance in there. Uh, but like it did also have some numbers in it, like FAR numbers, like some of them would say FAR one to two, which I think of as more like when you talk, talk about FAR numbers, it feels a little bit regulatory to me. But let, let's say in the future, there's a development proposal put forward in one of those place types like would they have to kind of rigidly adhere to the descriptions in there or would it be used more as kind of a guidance when the, the project is reviewed? Yeah, so subcommunity plans are used um, for guidance in development review. And then for those FAR numbers or density numbers included in that place types tool, um, we did provide sort of a range. And so, you know, I think um, for a lot of projects as they come online, it's great if in the site review process, we get opportunities to kind of negotiate about um, the best, the best um, design for the area, the best ways to incorporate um, community desires, and hopefully, you know, this place types tool and the subcommunity plan provides that guidance for development review staff to have those kinds of conversations. Okay, thanks. So it sounds like a, a bit of a mix that it, things would be expect, expect to be broadly compliant, but not necessarily hit every checkbox, maybe. I think that's right. Yeah. Great. And then my other question is, uh, so for the stationary master plan, which looks fantastic, uh, is that going to be a separate approval process uh, at some point? Or are we going to at some point the East Boulder subcommunity plan and the stationary master plan all at the same time? So um, we're hoping to bring them for adoption under one process. So because it the, the projects have been running parallel and um, they're incorporated in the same area, we would like to adopt them um, at the same time. Okay, that's good, that's helpful. I got a few comments, but I'll wait until that phase, thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Great questions. Um, we have Sam, Mary, Mark, and Rachel for questions. Sam? Yep. Thanks, Bob. And I will gush a little bit uh, later about how great this process has been, but thank you all for bringing it. I have essentially two questions. Um, one is on slide 15, um, you talk about mixed use industrial. And the, you know that's a pretty big designation that you're putting across a lot of different areas, <clears throat> including you know a flat iron business park, which is obviously huge uh, as far as employment base goes. And the uses definition here says light industrial use will predominate. Supporting uses allowed include residential, retail, service, and commercial. How? What regulatory tool are you planning? to ensure that light industrial use will predominate. Because when you allow a, a menu within a, a 
zoning district, a lot of people often pick whatever will produce the most profit. That's the way our system works. So what, what regulatory controls do you envision to make sure that if we did this kind of rezoning to MUI, that we would have light industrial use predominate? Yeah, so I think um, part of what we're hoping helps during these development review processes are, are those place type tools. And so we've got a couple of different place types that are applied to the Flatiron Business Park, for example. Um, but then, you know, it came up in planning board last week or, or two weeks ago, is there um, a percentage mix that we want to start to um, incorporate into our code that might indicate um, the type of use that should be on the ground floor versus uses above, the type of um, um, horizontal or vertical mix that we might want to see. Um, and I know, uh, Jay, we had talked about this a little bit earlier, so I wonder if you um, wanted to chime in at all. Yeah, sure. Um, some of the, we are actually developing case studies looking at this because it's the innovation mixed use that we talked about for the stamp area um, has that same risk of kind of the pendulum swinging too far if you allow it to start to. Um, and so uh, as we're looking at different case studies around the country and some projects we've been involved in, uh, some of the tools are um, making some of the uses uh, accessory to the light industrial prominent use. Um, we've seen really successful instances of uh, only allowing those additional uses beyond light industrial supportive uses, you know, I think is the term that's used in the place types. Um, based on proximity or adjacency. So it could be along certain street types. So maybe along the, you know, the major street, um, it could be along uh, rail, you know, things like that. Um, and so there's a, there's a host of tools that we'll be looking at and recommending for exploration and, a, and kind of the next step in actually creating the regulatory tools to, to address exactly what you're discussing. Okay, thanks for the answer. Um, I'm going to dive in just a bit deeper. Uh, you mentioned place types and you mentioned the, the stamp area. So if we go to slide 18, um, you know, the, the area at the intersection of Arapaho and 55th, particularly the northwest corner, you have this transit oriented flex. And so that's like one place type. But when I look, you know, right in there, there's the, the properties that are along Arapaho and 55th, which will be easy to access and you know possibly want to have retail there somewhat. And then you get in further into Western and places that right now have things like coffee roasters in them or very small robotics firms. Um, those feel to me quite different than what you might have on 55th and Arapaho, even though it's all within your place type of transit oriented flex. So um, I'm just curious, as you think about that particular corner in that area, which is, you know, that's where differently than Flatirons Business Park, that's where there are a lot of um, startups and they're a little grungier in the sense that, you know, the coffee roasters smell a little bit and the robotics firms need to test hardware rather than just software. So how are you thinking within that, for example, how you might get the um, mix that you showed later in the presentation of you know three, four, and five story buildings. Like, how would you approach that? I know it's pretty much asking for more detail or in my previous question, but I'm trying to focus where you've done a lot of thinking and examples. Like, how would you think about making that end up where you're hoping it will and not just gentrified housing at the end of the day with some software firms? Yeah, um, I can respond to that. So the, the transit oriented flex use shown in pink um, later in the presentation, I don't know what slide it is, um, but we do show the place types, a more detailed version of the place type. So we actually break that area into two, uh, actually three, sorry, excuse me, three different designations. So there's the innovation mixed use, which is uh, kind of north, uh, the northern portion, so, so not to interrupt, that's slide 51, just if we want to go to it. But yeah, you're right. Thank that you. Would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and then um, flex and flex mixed use as well. So uh, providing more nuance, I think, is critical, um, you know, in response to your question. And so the idea would be that the place types um, 
what we've done in other communities is that the place types end up corresponding to, you know, a handful of uh, zoning designations and our design guidelines. Um, so that again, it would be a next step after this vision is established and the policy is uh, adopted, um, looking at those specific implementation tools. But but we have provided more nuanced guidance uh, for how that works based on the differences with 55th and Arapaho versus being kind of deeper, um, you know, into the site. That's awesome. And, and I saw that. And then the, the concern that it raised there is around the designation for innovation mixed use. Um, you know, the, the picture that you showed looked fairly gentrified to me, you know, the exemplar picture that you showed for innovation mixed use. And um, I, I think you've answered my question. I'll come back to it, but I, I appreciate this kind of fine grained approach because it allows us to dive into those specific questions. So that's all I've got for questions, Bob. Thanks, Sam. Uh, questions from Mary, then Mark, then Rachel. Mary? Thanks, Bob. Um, my first question um, goes to Kathleen. Um, Kathleen, you mentioned in one of your presentations um, the San Lazaro Mobile Home Park and how there's been outreach done to the residents and um, there will be more outreach that will be um, conducted. And that's fabulous. Um, one of the things that um, stands out for me about that area is that it is out of the city. So my question is, um, what consideration has been given to a possible annexation? And um, is that, or could that be a goal of the area plan? So annexation of- or the sub-community plan, sorry. Yeah, annexation of, of that area is a recommendation included in the in the draft plan and um you know it's it's a privately owned property um that property owner has expressed interest in annexation um historically in the past um but i think everybody knows annexation is pretty expensive and so right now what we're working on is um looking at ways to um come up with some co-benefits for the city that property owner, and then certainly the residents of that community um, to be able to um, upgrade some of the, the facilities that are there, some of the infrastructure that is there and get those residents access to city services because that's one of the um, major things that we've heard from the residents in that area that they're really interested in. Great. Thank you. Um, and my next question is for Jay. Um, Jay, in your presentation, you um, were talking about how things will change slowly and that there are several ways that things will change by either um, by adaptive reuse or, um, or redevelopment or you know, all these various poten um, potential ways that it could evolve. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned is that um, that th one of the reasons that the area has not changed at all is because there's really no incentive to to change, and that one of the ways that you can create that incentive is through greater entitlement. Um, so my question for you is, um, what thought has been given to as um, the city provides greater entitlement, um, obtaining some of the benefit capture or, or considering benefit capture as we provide greater entitlement. Yeah, um, I will also tee up Rachel, um, who's on our team as well. She might wanna to contribute to this, but um, quickly my response is uh, we're absolutely thinking about it. <laughs> um, and, and one thing to clarify is um, sort of increasing entitlements doesn't always necessarily mean additional height. Um, so it can be a use that is actually, you know, has a greater return, um, like was mentioned previously. Um, also, it could be um, greater density on the site, um, FAR without height, um, which could be done through greater lot coverage, so on and so forth. But um, we are absolutely thinking about and tracking along with 
your all's conversation about community benefits and um, how to um, look at um, kind of creating a win-win situation, right? For the, ultimately the developer needs to have a certain return, but how can the community also see certain aspects that could be related to uh, public spaces, could be related to, um, we've talked about art and culture amenities, uh, public art, um, as well as uh, looking at uh, small business incubation. Um, all being different components. Um, Rachel, anything you want to add on that front? Uh, I would just add that that's been a part of the conversation from the start. Um, we haven't really talked about greater entitlements without the flip side of the community benefits um, and really just capitalizing on the strength in this area. And then also, as Jay mentioned, you know, looking at things like affordable housing or art and also looking at the concept of a district and as redevelopment happens sort of formalizing those benefits whether it's um, centralized parking or public art um, localized micro mobility options um, and just creating that structure for redevelopment um, so it's the expectation that those benefits are provided great thank you very much um, and that's all i have Thanks, Mary. Um, questions from Mark and then Rachel. Yeah, I want to follow up a little bit on some of the uh, questions that, that Sam raised. I want to get a better understanding of the uh, mixed use industrial zone. Um, how are you contemplating this visually? Are you, are you thinking in terms of a residential building across the street from a woodworking shop? Um, or are you thinking in terms of a residential structures on top of um, a, a welding shop? Uh, I'm, I'm a little unclear as to how this plays out in the real world. Yeah, so so yes and both. Um, horizontal mix of uses. So as you described, uh, um, a residential component across the street from an industrial component potentially, but also a vert vertical integration within one building. So maybe there's retail on the gr ground floor, um, some kind of light industry on the second floor, office or residential on third or fourth floors. I mean, uh, how is that going? To, how are those uses going to be compatible with one another? I mean, there are industrial uses that create odor um, or noise, and I, I find it um, perplexing that we're going to actually try to put um, residential uses right on top of it, or even perhaps across the street. Um, you know, there are businesses that that have heavy equipment that they have to leave in their yard, um, vans or whatever. Um, I'm just, is there a precedent for this? Are there other um, mixed industrial residential neighborhoods that, that have been successful that you're aware of? Yeah, so the, there's certainly precedent for it. Um, you know, I think locally, one of the areas that people look at um, has been how, um, the Rhino neighborhood in Denver has transitioned over time um, to incorporate more residential. But, you know, um, I think some other places or areas that have more of an industrial focus maybe than, than what we've seen in Rhino in, in recent years is um, the East Central neighborhood in Portland. Um, Jay knows a lot about that one. So I, I might ask him to describe it a little bit more, but, um, you know, our use review process will allow us to um, uh, help negotiate some of that and determine the, the um, best places for different types of uses and how compatible they are. Um, but certainly there are combinations of, of light industrial uses that can live um, uh, peacefully and friendly with, with residential uses. My, my next question is about the Parkside Residential. Um, will that be displacing um, industrial businesses? And if so, how many and what types are they? I mean, it's a very nice slide that, that shows the residential, but what is it in fact displacing? So the Parkside Residential place type, yes, it has a... Um, more intentional residential component. So the areas that it is applied to um, does in, 
pretend that some of those areas would transition to residential uses over time. The specific businesses that would be displaced, I don't, I don't think we could um, say right now. You know, the idea is that this would evolve over 20 years' time. So, um, businesses and property owners and and um, interest in development changes over time. And could we at least do a calculation uh, and, and a categorization of those businesses? We know we know the boundaries of the area. It would seem to be a fairly simple task to say it's going to be X number of businesses, and and uh, these are the types that are that the community is going to lose. I, I think that should be a knowing decision, an intentional decision. Yeah, we can definitely um, come up with those numbers. Okay. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Those are my questions at the moment. If I could respond super quickly on the compatibility um, issue. Um, I think Kathleen was absolutely right. It's about the type. There's a lot of different flavors of light industrial in particular. Um, and we're seeing more and more kind of clean, clean manufacturing, clean assembly, clean tech. Uh, be a piece of that. Um, and even, you know, some sorts of which some people like the smell, some people don't, but if you think about a brewery or a distillery, um, you know, those actually do have, you know, some nuisance effects, but a lot of people like being proximal to them. Um, but the idea would be to regulate those types of light industrial uses, manufacturing uses, that they're not the ones with the large layout spaces and outdoor storage. Um, because that wouldn't fit within the larger place type consideration around form. Well, I, I can tell you that I would be happy to live across from a brewery. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks, Mark. We have uh, Rachel for questions, and I'll have a, I have a question. And then I think if there are no more questions from council, we'll flip it around and have questions directed to council. Rachel, questions? All right, yeah. Um, thanks, Bob, and thanks for the awesome presentation, everyone. Um, I think I have two questions. We had um, looked at previous concepts that had a higher volume of potential new housing units. Um, and I think that community feedback had supported a higher number of new units. So I just wanted to clarify or confirm why we lowered our target or sort of the range of potential housing that could land here. Um, and perhaps that, that was in response to council's last check-in. I think that's to Kathleen probably. Yeah, so we did, we did look at um, a range of different capacities in those scenarios last time, um, but it's, it's not accurate that we heard from the community that they wanted that highest number. The, the feedback that we got was to really um, be targeted and um, just change a few areas to mixed use neighborhoods. And so, you know, I think in our um, survey process in, in that last engagement window, we, we had an option that um, asked people, do you want to maximize the amount of housing that we can incorporate? And, and that one was not a popular response. Yeah, no, I was thinking that there was the one that was most popular was in the 5,000s for the number of units and we mm. lived at a high of 4,000. So that's, I'm just trying to figure out why, if that's accurate, why it went down from fives to a maximum of four. Yeah, I think, I, I think based on the, the feedback that we heard, we really tried to um, balance the types of changes. And then we reran that model to see kind of where we were landing and, and, um, that's that's where we've we've ended up is is at the high end. I think it's about forty six hundred, and I have a range of like to twenty six hundred or something to forty two something like mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, and then I guess a related second question is what is and I don't know if, if this is even an answerable question, but like what is the density required in this region to make a 15 minute neighborhood feasible in terms of, you know, the number of people that will need to sustain extra ridership and routes. And I would think a more robust um, RTD and hop um, travels out that way, as well as uh, businesses, retail being willing to open to support them. So do we have the data on, on what the target number of new units is to sustain that in this area. Yeah, so we have, I, I don't have the numbers um, 
off the off the top of my head, but I know our community vitality group um, has approached a, a, a number of different types of retailers in the grocery or market space, which is really an essential component of that 15 minute neighborhood. Um, and so they have some density numbers around that. I might let Jean Sanson speak to um, what we know about density required to support transit stations. I'm here. I'm just trying to turn on my video. That might not work, but you can hear me. You okay. See, you can see and hear you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So RTD has has different density standards depending on the type of service, whether it's a local or regional service, and we can provide that information to you. And then they have certain standards as to when they would provide a bus stop and what type of amenities they would provide at that bus stop. So I'm happy to provide that information to you, but um, just from a ballpark and looking at the types of density numbers and the FARs that are included in these um, land use designations, um, we would expect to see a much greater um, demand for transit in the area as is already planned for the East Boulder sub community. So we feel pretty confident about that. Again, caveating, caveating, caveating all of this with we are tracking post-pandemic levels of ridership and doing what we can to work with RTD to bring back um, as much as we can, as soon as we can, knowing um, that we have a lot of constraints, um, including um, driver shortages. But again, in looking at this plan as a 20-year long-range horizon, we feel pretty confident that we're going to have the numbers to support robust transit. Okay. Um, thanks for that. That's helpful. And maybe I don't I don't know exactly what form it comes back to us in, but I think having that that data that that we're landing on the right number to support the 15 minute neighborhood would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I would just I I might just mention that um, there's a residential component to support that 15 minute neighborhood, but then certainly there's a, a workforce and jobs number component because that makes up such a big um piece of making those 15 minute neighborhoods successful, making retail areas successful, and and certainly the use of, of um, transit facilities and, and these different ideas about um, micro mobility that we have. Yeah, if I could, it's a, it's a bad term of art, but um, frequently in, in transit planning, we use the term activity units, which would be students, employees, and residents sort of all added up. And so typically there's a 20 activity unit per acre designated, like sort of minimum threshold, um, kind of used as a rule of thumb. Um, so we would be looking at sort of to Kathleen's point across the board, um, looking at employees and residents. Great, I'm gonna jump in with a question. Um, about five years ago, we set for ourselves a goal of creating 3,500 units of middle income housing um, we haven't done a whole lot towards that other than um, a plan that's on paper that uh, Sam and I put together a couple of years ago for a middle income down payment assistance program, which um, hopefully will get launched next year. But um, what uh, you guys were really great in, in running the numbers for us, you know, the, the numbers that you shared with Rachel as far as the number of housing units that could potentially come out here and then and then did the math on, on how many of those would be low income, which was great. How do we um, incentivize middle-income housing units uh, in this area, whether it's owned or rental? I think that's a great question, and and we're certainly working closely with um, Housing and Human Services staff to think up different options and strategies as part of our implementation planning. I probably don't have a, a great answer about that right now, but it's certainly something that the working group has um, really expressed a great interest in and, um, you know, been uh, a topic that um, has come up in all of our community engagement sessions as well. That's great. Well, I'll just leave it with you. If, if as you guys continue to work from 60% to 100%, if there are some really brilliant ideas that uh, somebody comes up with, um, whether that's sizing or um, regulatory incentives or regulatory disincentives or other things that would cause a developer to want to create a middle income product, 
there, um, in addition to their uh, inclusionary housing, low-income housing, that would be uh, really, really swell because it would be a, a shame if we end up with a bunch of really expensive condos uh, and then some cash and loop payments. Um, so mm -hmm. to the extent that you, you folks need something from us from a regulatory um, or legal standpoint um, to um, make this plan work and drive as much middle income housing uh, as possible, that would be great. Uh, we if, I, if I can just jump in on that question. Um, we did include um, in the market analysis, we did look at multifamily and other residential, um, and it's a challenge um, from a market perspective. Um, it's it's really challenging just to make it pencil. And we've seen with Park Mosaic, which is the most recent residential property in this area, it's rents are really expensive. Um, and so it's, I, you know, either using the, the cash and lieu payments and having a dedicated system to reinvest them in the community, um, whether it's partnering on a housing development um, or encouraging land set asides and then having, whether it's, um, nonprofit or other developers giving them incentives or other assistance to develop that on site. Um, but it, it definitely needs to be focused and targeted um, to make sure that that reinvestment happens in this area um, because the, the market won't provide it on its own. Great. I assume not. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for that, Rachel. Uh, we have questions from uh, Mary and then Sam that I think we'll turn to questions to council. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have one more question that I neglected um, when I had my turn. Um, in, I think it was uh, Kathleen that talked about, um, in response to a question, I think from Mark about um, industrial zoning and the concern that the planning board had about the diminishment of that. Um, one of the, and you said that it increased it's actually increased throughout the last few years. Um, the biggest slice of that increase was in IG at 17 acres. And um, the thing about IG is that housing is allowed in IG, which is great. Um, but my, but I'm wondering if in your analysis of that, you, you took that into consideration, that part of that IG um, of those 17 acres could be um, housing and therefore not an industrial use. Yeah, we really looked just at um, zoning changes. And so, yes, we're, we know that housing is allowed in that IG zone, um, but we did not look at, um, we did not run analysis at um, the level of detail to evaluate specific redevelopments across the city. Um, but, you know, I think we have um, that type of data tracked. And so that might, you know, if there's interest in that, that might be uh, another level of analysis that we could provide. Great. Thank you. Um, and that's all I have. And um, yeah, I guess we Thanks. can move on to comments. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have, uh, thanks, Mary. We have a, a question, I think, from Sam. And while Sam is asking his question, maybe somebody could put up the questions, the four questions to council so that we could uh, tee council members up to uh, to respond to those. So, Bob, I don't actually have a question. I'm ready to comment on the Great. Let's, let's put, put, up, put up the questions to us. And Sam, you go first, followed by Aaron. All right. So I, I do want to commend everyone on this team for such a great job. I mean, the Boulder hasn't done a sub-community plan in a very long time, and this is setting a great standard. Um, the way that it's being approached, kind of from a high-level vision all the way down, but including things like development mix and connections as you go down and, and get more and more granular is fantastic. And the community engagement has also been extremely positive. And I thought this presentation, it was extremely long, but extremely rich in substance and detail. So I'm glad you put it all out there. I'm impressed you got through it as quickly as you did. Um, so I, I do have a, a lot of specific comments, but I do want to start at the highest level, just like you guys did. And I recognize that this is land use changes that you're proposing and not zoning changes. So there's flexibility underneath things like MUI, and I get that. Um, but the concern 
will then just drop down to zoning that we have with some of those MUI comments. So however we get there, we're going to have to address some of those major concerns. And to Rachel's point about housing unit count, I think it's useful to go back, and I always try to every year, to, to our community profile. So we have our community profile, and if you look out from 2020 to 2040, um, our expectation is about 6,000 units of housing. And that's before any of this land use or rezoning happens. So the fact that we're looking at something on the order of 2,600 to 4,400 new units that would come from these kind of changes is pretty substantial. It's not doubling what we're talking about, but it is a substantial increase wherever it lands. So I think that is much needed in Boulder right now. And I think, you know, as we talk about the changes, we get really concerned about what we're losing, but we also have to keep in perspective what we need and what we need really is a lot more housing and not much of an increase in employment. So I think this plan has really clearly focused on what Boulder's needs are and these unit counts, you know, I don't particularly see a need to quibble over where we end up landing because anything in the mid 3000 new units is going to be a huge change in our plan. So I think that is really good. It's important and it's what we've asked for. Um, so I guess I'll start with the um, connections because you got to get here if you're going to enjoy the housing or the brew pubs or work here or whatever. And, and I am totally bought into the um, change in Arapaho. You know, we've been lobbying as hard as we can to get Highway 7 improved and better transit going all along. So that is a clear focus. The whole Northwest mayor is really focused on that. Um, I'm a little concerned that not enough attention has been paid to uh, pedestrian and biking connections. So I've said it before, and this may be my last crack at it, but how we can make better connections, like right now, if I want to bike <clears throat> on Goose Creek Path and get to Flatirons Park, I end up stuck, right? I come out and if I go more, if take Goose Creek Path down and, and head a little south, I end up in parking lots. And so there's no good, easy way to connect over to Western. Uh, there's a two super block set of parking lots in between. So our connection plan needs to figure something out there. Um, I've always said it would be great if Goose Creek could extend, the Goose Creek path could extend straight across over to 55th. We've got the railroad tracks there. I don't know if there's some easement that we can get along the railroad tracks because that would be another way to get from that kind of dead end area over. So I'll just raise that again, that that, that connection, and, and you guys know this, you pointed it out, but the other connections besides 55th and Arapaho are pretty crucial. And it's one of the reasons why everybody ends up in a car. So to that point, I think it, you know, having worked out there for a dozen years, having a bunch of e-bikes available that are just easy to get to, like having the stands for the e-bikes would totally change people's perspective at getting over to where they want to eat lunch or meet with people or have coffee or whatever. And so I, I think that that should not be given short shrift. And so anything that we can do to kind of saturate that area out there with those other mobility um, options, I think people will take them. I think they would be very happy for them. The other thing I will say about 55th and Arapaho is I'm a little nervous that if we're not careful, we end up with a bunch of housing, we need housing, but we don't preserve our neighborhood centers. So when I think of Community Plaza, I think where Ozo is and so on, we have to be super careful that those not only remain, but improve and become focuses because a neighborhood would use a good grocery store there and all the people who work out there would love to have more options rather than what's available, largely space constrained. So when you think about redeveloping that corner, I think it is critical to keep in mind that the focus needs to be a community center first and then housing second. And as you move elsewhere, I think you know the housing should indeed dominate. Um, to Mark's point, I think one big concern is how do you make sure that those uses 
that are light industrial are compatible. So I agree that there's a lot of assembly tasks, for instance, in light industrial, a lot of development and flex space tasks that would be very comfortable having housing nearby, and there's some that would not. And I think it, it is important to make sure that we preserve space for those which are not that compatible. And so that means that maybe housing doesn't mix in everywhere. And we kind of use your guidance. And I think, you know, this subcommunity plan at this level is a great way to give that guidance on where we want this loud, smelly parts and where we want the, you know, easy, like the pop sockets assembly kind of parts, right? So I think that's another key to success here is figuring that out. And then the last really, big part is we have to be careful about gentrification. Somebody brought up Park Mosaic. I mean, not only is it super expensive, but it wiped out a bunch of affordable middle income housing. It was rental, but it, it is gone now. Um, so I think, you know, as we go forward, I think we should be careful not to have everything be like super space age visualization because it looks like we're going to three to five story buildings everywhere and it looks like there's high bays so it could be industrial but then you got housing on top and i've always been curious about how that really looks there are people who have live work in boulder right now it's just illegal and so they're happy to you know live in a relatively small space that doesn't have great views of the flat irons or anything so that they can afford it. So, um, and so that's a, a bunch of stuff just to, to throw at you. Um, but, but I think that this is a really, really important visioning exercise. And I, I think you're totally on the right track with where you're going with it. I, I think the devil will end up being in the details of how you don't end up chasing out the industrial that we have. And, and particularly concerning to me, is people who want to start up businesses and need low rent you know that's what the gentrification will push out and so i'm i'm really concerned that you keep that in mind so and maybe it's part of the like what what is next to what as you go out there i think that's all i've got but i really appreciate the hard work you put in i think this is a great product Thanks, Sam. Uh, just a quick time check for folks. It's um, 8.55. We were scheduled to, to wrap this up at 9. We'll, um, we'll undoubtedly go a bit past 9. Uh, and I think that's appropriate in light of the fact that for some of our colleagues on council, this may be their last opportunity to weigh in on this plan. So let's uh, let's take a little bit a uh, little bit of time, make sure that they they and everyone else has an opportunity to weigh in, and, and let's just shoot to wrap this up around uh, quarter past the hour if we can. Um, we've got Aaron, and then Mary, and then Mark. All right. Um, well, can we bring up the, the East Boulder land use plan map, please? Because I think it would help for a couple of my comments. And while you're doing that, uh, let me just say again that uh, how great a job I think you've been doing. Uh, this is an exciting opportunity. East Boulder has almost no housing and lots of jobs, but very few retail opportunities. And uh, I think this, this plan is moving us towards like a mixed use walkable neighborhood where you know, there's retail opportunities and housing opportunities all mixed. So I think it's it's an exciting step forward. So I'm glad we're doing this and looking forward to the next steps. Uh, there we go. Okay, thanks so much. So um, I, I think it is appropriate that the plan has a mix of things that are not changing and a mix of things that are proposed to change. And we got that feedback from the surveys. And I do think that that makes sense um, I did want to highlight a couple of possibilities um, that currently aren't labeled for change that I think uh, could uh, benefit from being included in these uh, areas of change here. So I'm going to call it just a couple of specific places. So on the west side, you've got um, area number four, which is uh, the Park West. Um, I think you're talking about that. And it ends uh, at um, Goose Creek slash Old Pearl Street on the south side. It, it seems to me that carrying some of these changes across Goose Creek to the south could be really beneficial. You know, that's an area where the infrastructure is not in great shape, you know, the roads aren't in great shape, and you've got some older buildings there. And um, I, I really like your idea of the trail-oriented development um, land use type. I think that's really cool. It seems like the edge, uh, the 
the southern edge of Goose Creek could also use that designation. So I, I would suggest maybe combining some of that, um, some of that uh, trail oriented uh, type place type uh, with maybe some of the um, with some additional mixed use industrial on uh, kind of mirroring that that number four area on the south side. And the other one that I would point to is uh, to the east of the, the mixed use TOD, the stamp area, uh, there's a, a section of industrial land uh, before you get to number seven, the mixed use residential. And I think that that's another place where, you know, there's there's some older buildings and, and it's a lot of big parking lots and things like that. That strikes me as a very reasonable place to um, extend the mixed use industrial designation as well. Because uh, it's it, it's an easy walking distance to the transit oriented development and could really take any redevelopment over there could take advantage of those uh, transit opportunities, you know, as we're going to get with a, a bus rapid transit along Arapaho. And I, I think, you know, we definitely need more housing in our community. And um, this this version of the plan does have less proposed additional housing than some of the other ones. And it seems like we could add back in a couple more opportunities in targeted ways uh, in areas that that could benefit from some of those changes. So, so those would be my couple recommendations um, on the um, on the land use plan. And is it also possible to pull up those place types? That that other map with the place types. That's where I'm making a lot of demands here. Hey, Aaron, your lighting did get better as the sunset. I know, it worked out. Thank you. Uh, so I asked a couple of questions about this on, on email and Kathleen, thank you so much for your responses on that. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was if, if you look in the, um, the along Central Avenue, um, just west of South Boulder Creek, there's a, a purple section there, which is mixed use industrial, I'm sorry, Main Street Industrial. And I was like, well, well, it's kind of off to the side. Why is that Main Street Industrial? And Kathleen had a great answer about how they're thinking that Central Avenue on that east side could start functioning more like a Main Street and have become a focus of the, the neighborhood over in there, which I thought was a really intriguing possibility. And to that point, I just wonder if you might extend the Main Street Industrial place type across Central Avenue so that if, if you're getting Central Avenue working as a Main Street, that having that place type on both sides could really help then uh, push it in that direction of a, of a mixed use walkable you know main street um, so that was my my one place type comment so yeah thanks thanks very much for that so then moving on to the uh connections plan um, I, I think you're very much going in the right direction uh, i thought sam had some great comments about the connectivity extensions and keeping a very careful eye on the pedestrian and bike connections and since I do have a little bit more time on council, I, I'm going to wait for another bite at the apple. Um, as I, I didn't parse every single individual connection, so maybe when we get this back again in a few months, I'll go on for another 10 or 15 minutes with uh, individual comments. You can, uh, but I'll stop on that for now. Um, and then the the uh, stationary master plan, I think, um, looks fantastic. I think you've done a really finely grained job of thinking that through. And it's an, an exciting opportunity for that area. Um, and so my, my only comments here are on the kind of packaging of it. You had a, a, a labels about the potential heights and it included some five-story buildings. And, and I don't know that that's really appropriate to put on the height map. It, it can scare people uh, when you talk about the five-story building, but we really uh, very rarely get five-story buildings in town. It's almost only in hotels and very occasionally like on the back side of residential buildings. So you might you might label uh, those also four stories or four to five stories because uh, I think even the image that, that was shown of that corner had it as a four story building uh, even though it was labeled five in the potential heights. So maybe just soften that a little bit. And then the other was, uh, I think Sam commented on this, there were um, a few images of the changes and I, I really like that idea of saying, okay, here's, here's what it is now and here's how it could transform. Um, but the first couple though, I think they didn't, to me, capture the, the mixed use potential that we're talking about here. I mostly saw taller office type buildings in those pictures. And so just 
as we move forward, I'd recommend maybe thinking about those future opportunities as, as showing a little bit more of the, the street scape with a, you know, a retail or coffee shop or deli or something like that. And, and people uh, benefiting from, from that sort of a thing. Uh, I think the third image had a little bit more of that um, uh, kind of um, a little more character to it. So just a thought as you're going out and I'll, I'll call that part of my feedback on the engagement plan uh, that uh, I think there, there are ways that could be captured in a way that uh, or por portrayed it in a way that captures people's imagination, um, people's imagination a little bit more. Um, and um, that's all I got. Uh, great work and I'm uh, really excited to see the final phases on this. Thanks much, Aaron. Um, and we'll hear more from you um, soon, I think. Uh, Mary, what are your um, parting uh, thoughts on this? Parting thoughts indeed. Um, I will agree with what Sam and Aaron have um, provided us feedback so far, except for taking another bite of the apple later um, that Aaron mentioned. Um, I, I am interested in, um, I won't get to see it, but in looking at how, what percentage of that 17 acres in IG um, might really end up as industrial. Um, I, I suspect that it's fairly high because that there hasn't been much of, um, too many takers on the housing on the IG. So um, that's the first thing. And then um, I, would like to see the go, going from a recommendation to a goal of um, annexing San Lazaro, and here's why. Um, they have had tons and tons of water quality issues. That's one of the places in town that really does, I mean, it's not really part of the city right now, and we have been doing a lot of engagement with the community. Um, and the sentiment is that they want to be part of the community. and. I think annexation is a way to do that. So it should be a goal rather than a recommendation. Um, and so, because that would address the water quality issues, um, gaining access to city services. The other reason is that this is a golden opportunity um, to take perhaps some of the um, ARPA funds or the infrastructure um, bill money to leverage that for this particular use and um, and partner with um, the current owner of the site. Um, it, it seems to me like that has a really good chance of qualifying for those funds. Um, so th those are two reasons and one of them is a golden opportunity that I don't think we should um, let pass by. Um, my other comment is about the the benefit capture you know we've been doing that you've been tracking the community benefit and the community benefit um, right now provides only for um, heights above the zoning um, the allowed zoning height and so we don't have anything for increases in entitlement and so i think that part of the recommendations perhaps perhaps would be to make some changes to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan in 2025 that would set some policies that would um, talk about benefit capture in, um, in the case of increasing entitlements. Um, and that might also be the way in which um, we get more affordable housing, um, we get exactly what we want in terms of um, getting getting some buildings to do adaptive reuse um, and not necessarily being wiped out and then being rebuilt and totally gentrified. Um, I um, I just wanted to also just uh, mention that um, who knew that some folks really consider um, East Boulder a recreation mecca and an arts and culture mecca? Um, so that, that was that was a surprise to me, but I, I get it. It's at Valmont City Park, and then um, all of the little um, organizations out in East Boulder, which are um, part of an area that won't be changing. So the reason they're out there is because of the low rents. 
Um, but I want to thank you all for the work that you've done. This is our first sub community plan since like forever. And it is setting the stage um, really well for the next one. Um, and I think you have set up a great process template that I hope that we capture and move forward with the next one. So thank you all. That's all I have. Well, thanks, Mary. We have um, comments now from Mark, Rachel, and then Mirabai. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, I want to thank uh, staff for the work that's been done on this project. Uh, there's a lot of it that is uh, really very, very, uh, very, very good work and um, uh, reflects a lot of effort. And uh, I appreciate all the work that has gone into this. I, I'm very supportive of the station area master plan and the transit oriented development. I remain concerned, oh, before I, I continue, I would be supportive of, our, of Aaron's suggestions to take a closer look at some of the parcels of land um, for other opportunities to create housing. Uh, it, it's worth at least, you know, uh, providing an analysis of that and taking that, that closer look. Um, my main concern remains the mixed use industrial uh, designation. Uh, I think to the extent that we allow uh, commercial or retail uses, um, in that zone, um, we will be driving out the messier but necessary industrial uses that we rely upon, um, whether it's, a, again, a, um, a, a body shop, um, a woodworking shop. Um, these are things that are uh, necessary for us. Uh, we need them, uh, you know, air conditioner repair. And I don't know how compatible they really are with um, uh, residential and if there is an alternative to that uh, i'm quite sure that developers will uh, key in on the alternatives uh, in to the exclusion of the, uh, the industrial uses especially those that are again messy but necessary so i I'd ask you to take a closer look at some of that and to make sure that um, we, we don't lose those uses because they are necessary to this community. And uh, uh, when they're gone and we're all traveling to Longmont um, to, uh, uh, you know, to get a set of tires, um, we will regret that loss. Um, so that, those are my comments. Again, I thank you for the work. Um, and uh, you know, I hope you'll take a closer look at that mixed industrial zone. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Rachel, then Mirabai. Um, thanks, Bob. I will echo what um, Council Member Wallach just said. I've spent a lot of time this summer out in the industrial zone um, or, or spaces out in East Boulder. My son's working at a marshmallow factory, which has moved from East Boulder to farther East Boulder. And uh, so I've just been around it and, and agree that we need to um, support those local businesses and, and make sure that nothing we're doing tonight um, causes that that to collapse. Um, and then it's so great to have three former planning board members here. And those of you who won't be here to weigh in again, uh, your voice will be missed because you always have uh, very helpful comments on these sorts of things. Um, so I'm grateful and I won't repeat, nor could I um, match what you said when, when Aaron mentioned like, look at this little bottom, um, you know, these two bottom portions of the map, I was thinking, I, I would like to look at those. And so I'm wondering, like, <laughs> could we do a field trip for those of us who are going to be weighing in on this again? I think it might be helpful to, uh, you know, if it has to be just two by twos, or I don't know if we could go since it's educational as a bigger group for those who want to, but I think it might be good to actually go out and, and see uh, what exactly we're talking about um, with people explaining it in real time. So that's my request between now and the next time. Thanks. And thanks for all the hard work. Thanks, Rachel. Um, the last two people to hear from before I wrap it up will be Mirabai and then Adam. Thanks, Bob. And so most of what I have to say, I guess, has already been mentioned. So I'm just going to reiterate a little bit because these were some points that um, I I thought were important. Uh, so I'll just seeing as it was just mentioned about the industrial, I think that's incredibly important that we continue to protect and keep that um, as we continue to push jobs and types of businesses out of Boulder. It's difficult to um, keep our climate agreements if, if we're having to drive out of town to 
um, procure the services that we need. So that I'll just put a bid in for that. Um, I appreciate what Aaron said regarding the height. I know a lot of people, including myself, always get concerned about height. So I will say that I hope um, we can kind of adjust how that is on the map. But I'll also say that I hope as we work on the developments of the 15 minute neighborhoods and everything that's being proposed, we can also take into account of adding in more of the pitched roof and using some of that height um, so that these can look more homey instead of these weird, ugly square buildings that we always, always, always get nowadays. Um, and so trying to make them again, if we're gonna make these 15 minute walkable neighborhoods and live and work um, to continue on with um, trying to create again, the more European style village uh, and adding in more beautiful architecture. So um, in terms of the connection points, I'll just say, especially for the area, I don't work out there like Sam does, but I, I will say, I love the idea of the e-bikes. I'm out there a lot randomly just for, um, during especially during lunch times here and there and just the insane amount of traffic so if we can continue to offer modes uh that will allow people not to use their cars but the e-bikes and something they can access easily even if they're in work attire uh, so that they can go in their meetings without having to con you know get the area more congested by being in their cars i, I think that is going to be one of the most valuable things we can do for that area um especially during those really busy lunch times uh, which tend to last seeming from like 11 till two. So um, let's see here. Oh, and then I'll just uh, second what Mary said. I really think that annexation would be wonderful um, to fix some of the water issues. And this is just, as she's saying, a golden opportunity. So I'd like to back um, what she said on there. But other than that, I really wonderful job. I look forward to continuing um, watching board and getting feedback and engagement. And I think it's really exciting that we're moving quickly. Thanks, Mirabai. Uh, Adam, bring us home. Here we go home. Uh, I don't have that much to add. I think a lot of my council colleagues really covered it well. I will say in response to Mark, um, I don't have as much fear about the industrial uh, mixed use zoning where people could live there as well, just because believe it or not, some people like to live grittily. Um, it, it does happen and actually that does keep some rent rates and uh, housing costs down to some degree. Um, and there are people who are capable or even enjoy living um, near spaces like that. So uh, I don't mind that quite as much. And the nicest thing is uh, most places don't work past five or six and most people don't get home until five or six. So the uses, you know, kind of work out that way. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy where this is going. Um, I too have some interest in what we might be able to do in terms of additional housing, especially in a diversity of housing, uh, because this is one of those spaces where I think it would be beneficial to just have such a wide range that many different people of different backgrounds and incomes could uh, live here and work nearby. Um, I think this could be one of the overall most diversified types of land use in Boulder. Um, and we have the ability to do that here and create that here, whereas most of the rest of the town is pretty locked in. So that, that seems like a really cool opportunity. And I'd like to capitalize on that like, uh, like everyone else here. I uh, don't have nearly as much to talk about in terms of connections. There are people far wiser than me. So I'll leave that to the the Sams and the Aarons and the rest of council. Um, and that's about it. Uh, appreciate the presentation. It's really helpful and a lot of information in a short amount of time. Thanks, Adam. Um, I, uh, in the interest of time, I won't add any comments. I think everything that's been said that needs to be said, um, other than I will underline Rachel's request for a field trip. I think it would be great to get um, some of us out there um, and uh, seeing things uh, with feet on the ground. Uh, so uh, Kathleen, maybe that's something you can organize for the, uh, the fall or, or early winter. Uh, with that, I think everyone has weighed in. Everyone's had their questions asked. Kathleen and team, thank you so much for a great presentation. We ran a little bit over, but hopefully you got everything you need. Kathleen, is there anything else you need from, uh, from council tonight? No, I don't think so. Thank you so much um, to everyone for the great feedback and, and just um, 
the the guidance over the last couple of years with this council has been really really helpful during you know crazy times so i i really appreciate all the time and effort everyone's been putting into this project and um thanks to all our staff who who joined tonight as well great thank you everybody with that, we're going to turn it to our final topic. We've scheduled about 15 minutes for this, and this is a kind of part two of the discussion that uh, Rachel and I kicked off as the uh, process subcommittee um, last week on the city attorney's uh, search. We uh, recommended and council agreed that we should continue looking at candidates. And so Rachel and Jen will lay out um, a timetable uh, for the second part of this search, second uh, phase of this search, and also um, has have a few questions for council, if you all could answer those tonight so that we could get on with things over the next couple of days. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel and Jen. I think there's a bit of a presentation and uh, Rachel and Jen, I don't know who's gonna lead this part of it, but I'll leave that to, since I'm facilitating the meeting, I'll leave that to the two of you to. Thanks, Bob. I think uh, Jen's gonna kick us off with a couple slides. Great, thanks, Jen. Yeah. Good evening, Council. Jen Sprinkle, HR Director. I will um, just sort of recap what Bob said. Um, we had a conversation at last week's Council meeting, and then on Thursday, you all received an email with the position profile um, that's redlined, um, and we'll have some conversation about that in just a bit. But before we get to that, I wanted to sort of briefly go over this proposed timeline and process for the city attorney recruitment. So. Um, right now we're in position review. Uh, as I mentioned, you received a red line copy of that, which we can discuss tonight. And so that um, step is in progress. Um, as we think about uh, moving from the position profile to active recruitment, we would like to kick off a new visibility campaign and outreach uh, starting on July 30th. And that will be done by the recruiter. We will have, um, applications um, and the job posting open through the month um, of August. And so closing on August 30th. From that point, uh, the recruiter would provide uh, candidate materials uh, through this candidate review process. Um, we're recommending that be presented to the hiring subcommittee and so that the hiring subcommittee could select finalists. From there, we will proceed um, with a virtual semi-finalist interview process. And so what we're recommending here is that there is a, um, a group of stakeholders, the hiring subcommittee, city leadership representatives, the city attorney office representatives, and they conduct an interview process. From there, um, the hiring subcommittee will solicit feedback and hear from all those groups on how the semifinalist interview process went. Uh, we would like to provide you counsel with the semifinalist candidate materials in a packet so you could review those. And then the hiring subcommittee could share feedback with you about um, how the semifinalist interviews went and answer any questions that you might have about the candidates. Um, that would position the subcommittee to recommend finalists to you all, and you could select and vote on finalists at a council meeting in September. We're thinking September 21st would be ideal. And then from there, we suggest that we move to the in-person finalist interview process. This would again be Council interviews two by two, um, and the hiring subcommittee would solicit your feedback on how that interview process went um, and move to make a recommendation on the final candidate in October. And um, hopefully in the meeting on October 5th is what we're thinking. So that's the general timeline and process that we're proposing, certainly um, more conversation and uh, we can move to the next slide and I'll turn it over to, to Rachel really to help facilitate a, a discussion uh, among you um, around the position review and this proposed timeline and process. And I'm certainly here, Rachel, so uh, call on me at any time uh, for any of these questions. Thanks, Jen. Um, and thanks for laying that out so um, neatly and cleanly for us. So we just have a couple of questions that we are hoping as the subcommittee that um, colleagues will weigh in on tonight. Uh, the first two are on the position, um, the job description itself. So number one question that we want to confirm is, uh, is council comfortable waiving the residency requirement for this position? Um, previously, the city attorney has been required to reside in the city of Boulder. 
Um, if council chose to waive this requirement, we think it might possibly broaden the candidate pool. Um, it's it's a, the subcommittee's understanding that previous councils felt pretty strongly that the, or, or felt strongly enough to make it a requirement that the city attorney should reside in the city. So that's question number one for people to weigh in on. And I think we will stop and take feedback at uh, the end of each question. Um, and some feedback that I've gotten or that Bob and I have gotten is if we did waive this, we could still have like a, a county or certain radius residency requirement. So with that, can we get some, all right, Aaron, Bob, do you want me to call on people or would you like to? Go right them? ahead, go right ahead. All right, I see uh, Aaron and Mark on residency. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't waive it entirely, but I, I, maybe we could allow for exceptions. Maybe we could have something like um, uh, city Boulder residency strongly preferred, but um, you know, exceptions would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. I do think there's a value to having the city attorney live in the city of Boulder. Thanks, Aaron. Mark. Uh, yeah, I would prefer to have the city attorney live in Boulder, but um, if the trade-off is getting a better uh, set of candidates, uh, I would be uh, supportive of a Boulder County residency requirement. Um, uh, I, I don't know that there's a particular harm in having somebody live nearby if that's their choice. Um, it's preferable that they live in the city, but I, I just I don't know that it's, it's such a uh, a benefit in terms of, of the kinds of candidates we hope to get. Um, All right, yeah. thanks, Mark. I, I'm I can't see the hand order, so I'm sorry if I'm calling on you out of order, but I think Sam's next. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I, I think this is pretty important, but I don't think it should be inflexible. So one, you know, we offer a housing uh, low income, sorry, low interest rate loan um, for folks. And I think there's a housing allowance as well. Um, I, I would be interested in considering something like uh, within a certain period of time to be a resident. So in other words, maybe within three years, of accepting the position, the city attorney would need to um, reside in Boulder. Uh, and, you know, as far as the county goes, to be quite honest, there's folks who can get to the city of Boulder quicker from Broomfield than from northwestern Boulder County. Um, so I don't know that the county requirement does too much that's necessarily positive on that. So I, I guess I'd put out there that I wouldn't, I, I'd be okay with not making it a hard requirement but a super strong preference. And if it were gonna be a requirement, one way to soften it would be within X years of being hired. Thanks. Uh, Mary? I like um, Aaron's suggestion of creating and um, doing it on a case by case um, exception basis um, and not putting a geographical um, limit on it, except for like, I want to live in Vail and do my job remotely. Um, I don't think that would be acceptable. I will note that um, very deep in the memo for the East Boulder subcommunity plan, um, there was uh, there were people that work in Boulder asked that if Boulder built certain types of housing out in East Boulder, would they move? And they said, no, I already have my dream house. I don't want to move to Boulder. So, you know, that's that's the thing is um, if we found a candidate um, that just totally fits the job description to a T, um, they already have their dream home somewhere else that they're willing to drive from to um, the job, then I think we should consider an exception. Um, so. That's what I think. Thanks. All right, Mirabai. I have no problem with it. Simple. Thank you. Adam. Yeah, I'm willing to open up on the residency requirement because most of city staff doesn't live in Boulder. Most of our workforce doesn't live in Boulder. Uh, if that means finding the right candidate who lives a little bit outside of Boulder, that's totally okay. And I think sort of realistic at this point. Thanks. Uh, anyone else 
who hasn't weighed in yet? Maybe, maybe it's only you, Bob. Well, I, what, I think what I heard was, with, with the, maybe the exception of Sam, I, it sounded like most people were pretty flexible about the person not living in Boulder. I, I, Sam's um, approach is a little bit more chronological than it was geographical, which is, it'd be great if they lived in Boulder within a few years. I think everybody else was a little bit more relaxed with a preference towards Boulder residency, but a willingness to um, consider well-qualified candidates who lived outside of Boulder, if I could recap accurately. Yeah, I think it's a it's a probably should go in the job description if I'm hearing it correctly as a strong preference and exception could be made to to not live within the city. Is that I heard that as well. Um, and I think that will work. Okay. If anybody disagrees with that assessment, will you raise your hand? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Great. Okay. Um, so the second question that we need to answer is um, everyone received a red line version of the position and profile, which had been um, slightly edited. So just want to see if anyone has feedback or concerns about the new position profile. Yeah. I only had one question. All the changes look great to me. Um, the only question was there, there was an addition that the candidate should have supervised five other practicing attorneys or something like that. So my question is, what was the thinking behind that in particular? You want to take it, Jen? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, and so the idea is that the city attorney um, staff is, is fairly large. And so really thinking about someone who has experience managing a team. And so maybe five isn't quite the exact requirement. We could be a little flexible with that, but I think the idea there is, does this, has this person managed a team of professionals? So I, you know, I agree. That's an important characteristic. And so I would just make at least five a little more general, you know, however you want to phrase it, you know, direct leadership experience managing, you know, multiple other attorneys or something like that. Five just seemed like an interesting cutoff and maybe too specific. Everything else looked great to me. Thanks, Sam. Uh, any other feedback on the new position profile? Going once, twice. All right. Um, and then the last question is around the new timeline and process. I think everyone has had a couple of days to think about it. And so Subcommittee just wants to confirm whether uh, council supports the proposed timeline, which is obviously ambitious and condensed in the hope that we will get this wrapped up with the current council. Um, so is that supported the timeline and process? I see Adam and then Mark. Yeah, I definitely support the timeline. Only one process suggestion was uh, if we could record the semi-finalist interviews so other members of council could watch them if they so wanted to. I think we could get a lot more out of how they answer questions um, rather than having the subcommittee relay how they answered them if we can watch them ourselves as well. Jen, can, can we do that? Um, I want to check on that because I, I, I know that uh, only the finalist materials are subject to open record. Um, and, and so typically uh, folks, if they're semi-finalists, may not be notifying their current employer and um, may not want to notify their current employer if they're interviewing and not finalists. So I, I would love to just get a little bit more uh, information before um, answering that question, if we can do it or not. And, and if that's not possible, could we um, allow other people to just join the Zoom? No, we can't because then it'd be more than two. People can't like tune in and watch. Okay. We'll get back to you on that, Adam, it sounds like. Mark? Um, I support the proposed timeline. I do have a question with respect to the process. Are we doing anything different during the active solicitation period than we did last time? Or are we simply hoping that we'll get better results or different results? Yes, I can, I can take that one. Um, so as we think about what the active recruitment process looks like, this, this sourcing um, process, um, the strategy will shift a little bit. And I, I mentioned this a little bit in last week's uh, council meeting, but really the idea is to think about um, cities with similar council agendas and community engagement to Boulder. And that could be larger cities than, um, than, than, than this city. And so really kind of looking broad and going a little bit more national in that sourcing strategy. And initially we were looking um, 
we were hopeful that we might get uh, someone who was more local, had Colorado experience, really understood um, the city. But I think if we do a broad uh, sourcing strategy, we'll cast a wider net. If I could, if I could jump in, also, Mark, um, we've received commitments from several of the uh, people in the senior leadership in the city, uh, including the city manager, but also some of the people that uh, report to city manager who have relationships with um, people in other cities um, who would could be um, uh, contacted directly based on those relationships. And so I think um, the idea is that using our city staff and our networks, we would. Um, cast a wider net than simply relying on a recruiter. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Any other um, questions, concerns? Mary? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, in, I believe in one of the emails, I saw that um, there's been a change in the consultant or we added a consultant. Um, is, has that changed? No, it hasn't. So the the contract is with Raptelis. That's the sort of legal name of the entity. Uh -huh. um, however, the Novak Group is um, what you will you probably commonly know uh, the recruiting okay. team as. Okay, that explains why I was puzzled. Thank you. And we did internally add um, someone else to the email, so that might have been it as well. Yes, we recently hired a senior HR business partner that supports the city attorney department as, a, as one of her client groups. Her name is Sherry Martin and she's um, engaged with me in this process. Any other questions? We want the process to move fast, but don't want y'all to feel rushed. So I'll give it another second. <laughs> Sounds like we're no hands. I'm going to turn it back over to Bob. Thank well, great. Well, th th thanks, uh, Rachel, and thanks, Jen, and, and thanks to Council for your support in this. We, as as Rachel said, we will move quickly, but we will not be rushed. Um, we will keep you apprised every step of the way. I will probably ask CAC for periodic check-ins, uh, Rachel and I, with uh, with you, um, if, if, if not every every week, every other week for the duration until we get to early to mid October when we hope to have uh, a recommendation to you to um, to uh, extend an offer to someone. Uh, and if it, if it doesn't work, then we're gonna keep on working at it because this is an important hire and we're not gonna settle. We're gonna do the best we can and we're gonna, um, we're gonna find the right person. And we've, uh, we really appreciate the um, offers of assistance from uh, uh, the city manager and her senior staff and helping us find those, those right people out there um, around, the, around, the, around the state and around the country. So thanks for everyone for their support on that. And uh, this feels right to me. I think uh, absent uh, anything else from council members, we are uh, ready to adjourn our meeting at 9.36. Anything else from anybody? I just wanna say thanks to you and Rachel for all the work you're doing on this. It got extended, so appreciate you sticking with it. Very, very good work, thank you. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, with that, I think we're adjourned. See everyone next week. See you next week. Good night.